Welcome, dear listeners, to Horror Den of Misfits. And now, Story Time. I'll never hunt alone again. I had pursued my game for hours, stalking stealthily and quietly in woods that only I had permission in. I finally was within shooting distance. I brought my rifle to my shoulder, scoped to my eye. Just above the deer's shoulders, I saw another hunter, aiming at my deer. My first reaction was oh my god. How could I point a rifle at someone? Because the first rule of hunter safety is be sure of your target and beyond. I still feel like an idiot for that. I lowered my rifle instantly, and before I could call out, a shot rang out. He clearly missed the deer and struck a tree beside me. He fired again as I dropped to the dirt, covering my head, hoping the shooting would stop. He took four shots. The last two sounded like hits. So I got up on a knee, discharged my rifle in the air and yelled what the F dude. He had shot my deer. He was on my turf. I ran over there intending to kill him. But when I got to him, it was apparent that he was in his 80s. He apologized profusely. He was shaking more than I was. At the end of it all, he said that he would never hunt again. I helped him drag the deer back to his truck, and I gutted it for him. If he would have shot me, I'd be a missing person never to be found. Lots of wolves in the area. Would have eaten me completely. We were in the upper peninsula of Michigan attending deer camp. It's really fun, and I recommend it to anyone who enjoys hunting. I was headed for my tree stand, and my hunting buddies went to their blinds or stands as well. We were all hunting G solo, each about half a mile away from everyone else. As they dropped me off at my trail and drove to theirs, I felt as if something strange was happening. I kept noticing things flickering at the edges of my vision but could never quite see what it was. A bit spooked now, and walking just a little bit faster, I was in a dead sprint, hindsight, not the best idea with a loaded rifle, I made it to my stand and climbed up. Even from there, I still saw flickers in the bushes by my stand, and I was now really anxious. My phone was dead, having a cold phone just kills the battery, so I had my rifle trained on the bushes. After a while, the shapes went away. It had gone on for what felt like six hours but was probably about half an hour. After it got dark, I got down from my stand and found wolf tracks everywhere around my stand. I was about ready to piss myself from fear at this point. Very slowly and with adrenaline pumping, I walked back to the road. However, I found a deer carcass, and it was fresh. Like the blood was still flowing from some places. Of course, there were wolf tracks. It was then I heard a wolf howl and I actually did piss myself. I don't remember getting to the road, but I got to the road with chills up my spine and very afraid. I got picked up after I was running down the road toward where the truck was coming. It took a while to explain why I was doing that and why my pants were soiled. They made fun of me a lot. We reported this to the Michigan DNR guy. He noted it and was nice about it. We found out that the wolves had killed someone's dog too. I didn't hunt in that spot again, partly because the wolves had made the site hot. The next year, when we went, the other hunters said they hadn't seen any sign of wolves in the area this year, which was weird because they were so active the last year. We think the DNR took care of them. Hunted rabbits, cottontail and jackrabbit, when I was a pre-teen or teen with dad and his friends. Sometimes, we would use dogs to flush rabbits out. One particular outing, the dogs flushed a rabbit out my way. I took aim with my 410 and took it down. Typically, we would dress, gut and skin, in the field. So, my dad and I was dressing this particular kill, and, lo and behold, it was pregnant. The mother was dead but the babies were still very much alive and wiggling in the now discarded uterus. Well, the dogs quickly devoured the unborn rabbits. I went hunting again a few more times, but not as an adult. I prefer the blissful ignorance of not knowing the truth about the circle of life. I was scouting for roe deer for the upcoming deer season. 
I know my area like the back of my hand, familiar with every buck, hind, and sprong, family group of roe deer, that lives in the area. I've been logging all the wildlife, plant varieties, and even weather conditions in my notebook for years. I knew a really big roebuck was probably using this one trail, so I decided to go out at dawn to see what would come along on the trail. I found a nice spot downwind of the trail, about 10 meters away. Looking at a big oak tree, it sort of blocked the trail and thereby forced any animals to walk around it and into my line of sight. I sat and waited. And waited. I saw a few hares, a hind with her young, loads of squirrels, and a pine marten. The morning dew came with some low fog. Nothing too bad, so I stayed put. Suddenly, it appeared fog came out of the big oak tree. In my country, we call it wit -wijven. Nothing weird though. It happens when the morning or evening sun hits one part of the tree, warming it up while the other side stays cold. It's stuff for local legends about witches and stuff. So, back to what happened. I sat in wait, morning dew and fog came. Suddenly, fog came rapidly out of the big oak tree. I didn't know how, but suddenly there was a soldier. He stepped through the tree fog, or out of it, yelled something, and walked off into the distance. It scared the daylights out of me. I feared I might have ended up in a military training exercise, which was impossible since the nearest possible military site was 200 kilometers away. The soldier didn't look anything like my friends who were in the actual military. Just a steel helmet, greenish suit, belt, boots, and an old rifle. It confused me in a really scary way, it wasn't natural. I never told anyone, fearing people would make fun of me. However, two years later, I got confirmation it was a ghost. They found the remains of a World War II soldier in that tree. He had probably been up there since the invasion in 1940. It was October 1, 2019, in Los Padre National Forest near Santa Barbara, California. It was the worst night of my life. I went on a solo backpacking trip and I had mapped out a loop trail which I didn't really know if possible. I didn't know this area very well and I didn't think the trail had been maintained for over a dozen years. My guess is that it would be about 50 miles but I really needed to figure out what I was planning on doing in 3 days. But I had enough food for 5. About 7 minutes into my hike I found this beautiful campsite area with a waterfall and natural swimming hole. I didn't make it as far as I would have liked to on my first day but I couldn't pass up swimming in this beautiful creek in this slot canyon. I set up my hammock went for a swim, ate some dinner, and turned in early. I figured if I hit the hay early I'd get up before sunrise and get back on pace. I woke up about an hour later to find that dreadful feeling of being watched. It was absolutely horrible. There's only a sliver of light left from the sunset so I decided I would pitch a tent, then rain tarp on, and go back to sleep. I set up the tent faster than I've ever set up a tent before. I felt as if I was being watched the entire time. I crawled in and tried to force myself back to sleep. I guess the tent gave me a false sense of security, out of sight and out of mind. I fell back asleep. Several hours later, at about 2 in the morning, I was woken by a whistle coming from up the creek. I sat up in my tent listening. I didn't hear any birds, crickets, or anything. I don't even think I remember hearing the creek or waterfall. But five minutes passed and as soon as I laid my head down I heard the same whistle again from about 200 yards up the creek. I sat back up, my eyes as big as saucers just listening. I knew that this wasn't a bird or any wildlife. I sat perfectly still in my tent and listened. I then heard another whistle from 200 yards down the creek this time. The original whistler up creek quickly responded to the whistler down the creek, then straight up the cliff side in the canyon above me. I heard a third whistle respond every minute or so. They would take turns whistling one minute, it would be from up creek. The next minute from down creek. Then the following minute up above me on the cliff they took turns in perfect order, never going out a turn. I listened to this for about half an hour before I realized that the whistles were closing in my tent. The whistles were getting louder and closer. First, it was 200 yards, then 150 yards, then 100 yards, then 50 yards, until all three whistlers were right outside my tent. 
They're whistling down at me. I was shaking in my sleeping bag terrified. What followed next was the worst experience I've ever had in my 31 years of life. The ground began to shake like an earthquake and I felt electric shocks going through my body. It was very painful. I think I let out an involuntary yell from the pain. Tears were rolling down my face because I was so terrified. I mustered up my strength and yelled from the top of my lungs, leave me alone. Then silence. The electric shock stopped, and the ground stopped shaking. I tried to listen as best I could to any noise while shaking with fear in my sleeping bag. I then heard a stern voice in my head telling me to leave. He sounded angry. It's the same mind speak that I heard years earlier. They then turned and started to walk away from me. I could feel the ground shaking as they left. They then entered the thick of the forest and broke trees and branches till they were all out of range. I stayed awake in my tent all night until first light and then went back down the way I came to my truck. I could not complete the loop trail, I was going home. I ended up not leaving my bedroom for three months other than to get food. I was terrified to even go outside my home. Friends and family started to worry about me finally. I told one of my friends what happened. I even got a therapist who specializes in PTSD and told him everything, probably saved my life. I was probably as close to unaliving myself as I could get. My friend got me back out in the woods and even got me to go overnight camping on several occasions but I highly doubt I'll ever go solo backpacking in the woods for the rest of my life. This just happened, so nothing is foggy or blurred by memory. Hell, we're still even sitting right where it happened. My friend and I are sitting on his porch between 1 and 1.10 am. We're watching TikToks and drinking Monster, important because neither of us is, or was, under any alcoholic influence. We were just sitting here when we heard something fall, and his cat rushed off to where the noise came from. This cat is very territorial and is very defensive of where he lives. So, any other animal on the land would immediately alert him. We heard a cat fight ensue. My buddy instinctively pulls out his knife as he's ready to defend his cat. We run down to where the fight is happening, and my friend is making noises towards the fight, trying to break it up. I see my friend's cat dart away, and we hear a teeth chattering noise. This is all happening near his camper, so as we round his camper, the creature is hiding somewhere. This is when we see it walk out beside his shed, and my friend chases after it. He says it's a brown color and he saw it running on two feet. This man is six foot four, decently built, and a hunter. Seeing it run on two legs made him stop in his tracks. My friend has hunted all of his life, from raccoons to woodchucks to deer. Anything in the Ohioan wilderness you can think of. And this made him stop in his tracks. We see it dart under the shed after my friend chases it. After the initial encounter, my friend saw it go under his second shed. He said all he saw was a tail dart under the shed. As I was writing this, my friend heard it growling and got up with his knife. When he got out to where the growls were, he saw it dart back under the shed. Our speculation is that it is a raccoon or possum. But my question is, can raccoons run on their back legs? A report that was originally sent to the Pittsburgh Gazette describes encounters with what the residents of Mahaffey, Pia called a wild man. Could it have been a Bigfoot? The wild man of Mahaffey. A dispatch from Mahaffey to the Pittsburgh Gazette says, the people of this village are trying to solve a mystery. On Saturday, May 26, a gentleman driving along the road leading from Kerwinsville to this place, Mahaffey, Notice smoke issuing from a pine thicket on the south side of the river a mile below Mafi. In the center of the thicket is an old tumble-down log stable, used years ago by lumbermen for their horses. The ground adjacent to the thicket is an open pasture for cattle. On Sunday last, while Mr. Johnston was looking for his cow, he noticed a man suddenly bound out of the stable and make for the woods as if afraid to meet a fellow creature. On other occasions, this same man has been seen but always fled like a wild animal when observed. Yesterday Squire W. W. McQuown and Emery Mahaffey made an investigation of the place and found in the old stable a rude bed made of hemlock boughs and a fireplace a few feet from the couch, where the strange individual cooked his meals. 
No person was to be seen, however, the hermit had evidently noticed the approach of the party and escaped to the mountain a short distance back from his lonely habitation. A den of rattlesnakes, only a few hundred feet from his camp, which is the terror of the neighborhood, must certainly furnish weird music for the lone citizen. The hermit is a man about forty years of age, with a tall and commanding figure. His hair and beard are unkempt, and he looks as though he has been roughing it for months. Who is he? That is the question the people of Mahaffey are anxious to have answered. I'm from California but me and my family lived in Atlanta for about two years, from 15 to 17 years old. The entire time living there was a saga within itself but I can remember one specific incident that was unsettling. When we arrived in Atlanta, we stayed in a hotel for some months, looking for places to live. There was this handyman who worked at the hotel, he was a white man maybe in his mid-forties, large belly, wore glasses and always dressed in the same camouflage jack that kinda made him resemble a hunter of some sort. He seemed friendly enough, he would always wave and joke around with all the kids and with my parents and we were cordial with him. His friendliness started to become excessive towards the end of our stay, it got to the point where he would yell up to us from outside our window. We would call back to him and laugh with him, make light of the situation. But it became uneasy for us when he kept doing it, night after night, patrolling the parking lot. At one point we just ignored him and turned the light out as if we weren't there. He became even more aggressive, shouting to us and shining a huge flashlight in our window, whistling up to us and joking about how he knew we were still up. He had a weird high-pitched laugh mixed with his southern accent that didn't sound like he was playing around, it was more sinister. In a sadistic, pee-wee Herman kind of way, I can't describe it. I can't remember everything he said specifically. But there was a comment he made about us one time that made my father very uneasy, he compared him to someone on Unsolved Mysteries lol. There were little things he said about all the kids as well, how cute we were or something to that effect that never sat well with us at all. It came to a breaking point when one day, we went downstairs to our car and saw a hangman figure drawn in the dust on the back window. I'm mixed, as are my siblings, my dad is black, my mom is mixed raced. We're in the middle of Atlanta, Georgia, the deep south in a very awkward position. We're totally new to this state, I've never left the west coast before that point in life. This image creeped everyone in my family out, we knew he was the one who did it. My dad confronted him about it and he played it off, denied that he meant anything by it at all and apologized profusely. But the way he did it was in the same weird, joking manner that he talked to us with, so it was very hard to take seriously. This, and the fact that this hotel was robbed at gunpoint in the same week motivated us to leave immediately. I never saw this man again though we had many other insanely creepy experiences down south, and after a while we just came back to California and never looked back. My friend likes to go mushroom foraging, and one time, she brought me along with her. We got further and further into the woods, getting distracted by cool rocks, different mushrooms, a cool stick, or even just by talking. We were having a great time, just the two of us, until we stumbled into a clearing where a man was sitting, skinning what looked like a deer. I was frozen for a second. I mean, I only moved to this yeehaw ass town about a year and a half ago. I'm from the Bronx, where you can see some weird stuff, but I am definitely not used to hunting culture. My friend and I were just sort of frozen. The man looked up, covered in blood, and said, you know it's not safe for girls like you out here, right? Then he let out a raspy laugh, instantly chilling my bones. He picked up his frighteningly large knife and just kept skinning the deer, muttering about all the dangerous animals in these woods. My friend and I were just nodding, not sure what else to say or do. He looked back up at us and said, there's the bears, sure. The mountain lions. The fisher cats, and the rabid coons. But the most dangerous thing out here? He leaned forward and pointed the knife. Man. The most dangerous game there is. My friend and I made eye contact and just. Booked it. Running through the woods, through bushes and thorns, we eventually found our way back to her property. Not sure if creepy hunter guy was just scaring us for shits and giggles, 
But F, it was creepy. I'd like to think he just got fun out of scaring two teenagers, but Jesus Christ. I'm not in the mood for this dude to pull a Robert Hansen. I'm 24 years old and female. This is a bit hard for me to write out, but I think it's important to address. So my parents split when I was young. Neither my dad, nor my mom had their act together, which in turn caused me to not have my act together. From a young age I was drinking and experimenting with recreational drugs. I was just falling into a cycle that my family has always been in. My mother had a tendency to sleep around with anyone that would give her the time of day. This meant inviting some really creepy guys into out home. I think it's important to mention that she was a drug addict and didn't consider the danger. I had been arrested a few times before the age of 15 for either fighting or underage drinking. I was a mess. One night my mom and her occasional boyfriend were waiting up when I stumbled in drunk. This was the moment I realized I needed a change. My mom's boyfriend had pushed me down and then pulled me into another room of the house. My mom started banging on the door begging him to let me go. To this day I still won't forget that sinister look on his face. It gives me chills just thinking about it. It was the face of someone who had bad intentions. It was a little smile and I swear it's burnt into my brain. He said something along the lines of I'm about to show you why it's bad to let your mom worry about you. I screamed. He kept coming at me, but I put up a fight. After a couple minutes of struggle I scratched him in the face. Then he became enraged. Thankfully my mom had phoned the police and he was arrested before anything serious happened. There was a cop that was always present when I got in trouble. He was around 60 at the time. I remember he was always giving me shit for my behavior. That night he was there. My mom was taken into custody along with her boyfriend, so I was sitting and waiting with him while they were getting my story. Then he said something to me I'll never forget. I'm really sorry about all of this. I'm sorry but you're not going home. And then he told me it's time for you to change. Do you want to end up like her, or do you want to be somebody? I told him that I wanted to be somebody. I wanted to break that cycle. I was put into foster care, which was a horrible experience at first, but it ended up being what I needed. He and I stayed friends until he passed away about a year ago. I always went to him when I needed guidance. I'm happy to say that I've been a corrections officer for the past two years because of him and I'm pleasures to honor his memory by pursuing a career in law enforcement. Also losing me was what my mom needed to get her act together. She has been sober for almost 10 years and is remarried to a wonderful guy. Hopefully this was somewhat encouraging. Just before dawn, still dark, with a flashlight in one hand and a bow in the other, I snuck through the darkness as best as I could, careful not to snap a single branch that lay on the forest floor, making my way to my tree stand. Carefully and quietly, I climbed up and sat motionless. The sun began to rise and out from the nearby swamp one of the biggest bucks I had ever caught a glimpse of cautiously crept up over my left shoulder. Deer tend to move about and feed at dawn or dusk. This giant buck seemed to make sure to keep his body mass behind every tree, blocking any chance of me possibly taking my shot. Praying he would make his way to my small, but, legal, bait area of apples and carrots, he circled and surveyed the woods, but, regretfully, he walked back into the swamp. I sat there motionless. Rethinking every step the large buck took. Could I have taken that chance of a bad shot? Should I have? Second guessing every moment of that situation, occasionally sneaking a drink of water, opening a small jar of dough scent to mask my own. The rest of the day was peaceful yet extremely uneventful. Dusk approached. It was about 5 o'clock, maybe 5.30, I wasn't going to check my watch. Today was the last day of bow season, tomorrow was gun season. Every nut with a gun and a beer would be stomping through the woods nearby on the state land, shooting at anything that moved. Snap! Something broke a branch behind me. The small crunches on the ground were getting closer. My heart pounded. With every cautious crunch I imagined the giant buck was back and all my patience had finally paid off. I envisioned his every step as the noises became closer and closer. The noise stopped directly below me. Something was scraping my tree bark. 
My mind imagined the massive buck rubbing his magnificent rack lightly against my tree, then abruptly without a care in the world, I heard it. Hey check it out. This spot looks great. There's even some apples laying on the ground here. Then the other idiot said with a sinking feeling, dude. This is somebody's bait pile. Tweedledee and Tweedledum looked up at me and I just said, what the f is wrong with you two? You're on private land. You had to have seen the signs that read, no trespassing and you cross the barbed wire fence. Get the f off my property. Not exactly related, but when I was around 5 or 6 years old, my parents took me and my siblings to Australia to visit our grandparents. My grandpa, who was a soldier and quite impressive because he owned a lot of guns, I assure you, I have no intentions of becoming a school shooter, took us to his backyard to camp overnight. As we were about to go to sleep, a snake sneaked into our tent. I saw it and didn't think much of it, other than to inform my grandpa. It turns out the snake was quite venomous, so when he saw it, he grabbed it by the head, twisted its head around, and just yanked it off. Since it was a baby, it was easy to decapitate, and it wasn't too venomous. However, that experience scarred me for a bit, since I was only six. The act of him ripping its head off was what scared me, not the snake itself, by the way, I handle snakes quite a bit, so that's why I wasn't scared of the snake. I've camped solo for years and I've only had two creepy encounters. One while hiking solo in the mountains a guy turned around mid-trail to follow me for about two miles. The other time was in the desert when I was boondocking on BLM land in my tent, solo. There was a dirt road nearby that didn't get much traffic. I was being lazy, lounging and getting sun all afternoon. I noticed a truck that came by and then came by watching me again. And again. Late that night when it was pitch black at about 2 am I was awake already and saw headlights coming up but they turned them off, going by slowly. I peeked out the flap and saw the truck's tail lights up the road, he was stopping. I grabbed my headlamp and keys fast and got out of the tent into my car and turned it on. The truck left. I did not sleep all night and stayed in my car, doors locked. Looking back I should have ditched my tent and gear and just left but I liked my stargazer chair. I was in a national park hiking and scouting an area for hunting. I ran into a marijuana grow and got into a gun fight with some Mexican dudes. I ran back to camp and told the camp host and he cleared the entire campgrounds and made everyone leave. The next day I went back and wardens and local LEO had about 20 people and two helicopters at the campgrounds. I went back in with the boots on the ground. Wild experience. My bother and I have been comping solo on private property starting at 12 or 13. Once we got driver's license we started camping all over the state. We were camping on core land or national forest where in a short walk we could squirrel hunt from camp which was also on a major creek feeding a lake where we liked to run limb lines to catfish. We had a guy in a nice bass boat pull up on us basically yelling at us that we could not hunt on the creek nor could we use limb lines to fish which was completely wrong. The guy got livid at us. Threatening to come in the shore and beat our ass. Mind you my brother and I was holding long barreled shotguns during this entire encounter. We just turned 90 degrees to him and slipped back into the woods. We did not leave but we did swap watches that night just to be safe. Yes I have. I was solo hiking or backpacking through a provincial park in Ontario. Canada and as a single woman I've always felt safe yet aware of the risks. I was settling down for the evening at a very secluded spot and this really tall man just wandered into my space and started talking to me. The sun was actively setting at this point so in the back of my mind I was concerned for him. Like how was he going to set up camp? I asked him if he's camping nearby and he said no, he's just hiking through. We were like 9 hours hiking time from the highway but I felt super uneasy. He got closer to me and seemed incredibly friendly yet socially awkward, and invited himself to kind of sit in the camp on a log. 
Our conversation died and I was hungry and eager to start eating and prepping my dinner. Yet he didn't leave. He sat there in silence for almost 45 minutes as I was setting up my camp. I started to feel unsafe and uneasy through this and my heart rate was super high. After 45 minutes he stands up and said he might as well get going and left. It was pitch black outside. I didn't sleep at all that night, something about him made me super anxious. The only time I felt myself relax was when I was back in my car the next day. Just went solo camping recently and my close-ish neighbors who were RV camping were the absolute worst. They were drunk off their asses day or night which is fine, but that meant they were extremely loud while thinking no one could hear them. Multiple things were said about me and their other neighbors including her black dent means she's a part of BLM, I think she's a and mutt, I'm biracial, women like her are gonna be the end of us, she's obviously doing drugs. She's obviously a lesbian then a bunch of xenophobic shit about the other campers. Half the time they sat there literally just watching me set up, process wood, etc. These dudes then proceeded to drive their truck by my campsite a few times and once actually came to a full stop and just sat there staring. One of the couples that were part of their camp also got into a bad fight during the day. I have camped a good amount in my life and they top the worst people I've been next to. It was honestly bizarre. I ended up staying for two days cause I was watching for eagles, but the trip was definitely a bummer. Outside of them, most neighbors and trips have been wonderful. I car camp in very remote boondocking places. Once years ago when my kids were little and we had a minivan we were camping in such a place. I saw an old Ford pickup drive by stop and look us over for a weird amount of time. I commented on it to my wife and couldn't quit thinking about it the rest of the evening. Anyway, we went to bed and was all asleep when I was immediately awakened by that same old pickup, very recognizable sound. I checked my watch. 1.30 am. I could see through the tent window and from the little ambient light could see that they had cut their lights and motor and was coasting down the little road we were on. A ways from our camp they stopped and the passenger exited the vehicle with something long in their hands. Ball bat, rifle, tree limb. Who knows? I was now watching him through my rifle scope but could not tell what he had. He started walking towards our tent so I started yelling at him. Stop, go away, what do you want? All of that. I told him stop or I will shoot you, nothing phased him and he acted like he wasn't hearing me. I mentally set a boundary where if he crossed it I was going to shoot. He advanced to that spot but stopped right at when the driver of the pickup said hey, we probably shouldn't do this, get in. He walked back to his rig and they left. This was absolutely the only time I've ever felt threatened while camping. Went camping at Baxter State Park in Maine. For those who don't know, the camp is entirely dirt roads, about a two hour long drive through the park. We're staying at a site about an hour into the park for three days in the middle of summer. We get there and are checking in at the gate, and a tiny blue sedan with New York plates driving around us, honking their horn and cheering out their window. This then proceeds to be the one single car we see for the entire rest of our trip, at a popular main park in the middle of July. And we see them everywhere, constantly. Whenever we're driving, they are behind us or drive past us, we're sitting at our campsite and whenever we look up they drive by. They drive by whenever we are in a parking lot headed to our own vehicle. When we go to leave at the end of our trip, guess who else is leaving, and chases us from our campsite all the way to the highway. Was solo camping at a campground with absolutely zero reception for at least a 30 minute drive in either direction. I was really looking forward to unplugging after a crazy month of work. The campground was near empty, despite Reserve America saying otherwise when I booked my site, as I was setting up there was an older guy walking past my site on the road having a field day talking very loud to himself. He sees me and says hello then continues on his way only to circle back and take a trail by cutting through to it right behind my site, I never saw him again though so no worries there.
The next night I was sitting at my campfire reading NOS 4A2 by Joe Hill and it was close to 10 or 11 p.m. Can't remember what time now and I hear footsteps by my car and see a headlamp bouncing up and down. There's a dude just coming into my sight when I bounce up and ask can I help you? He then stops and tells me was coming to see if I wanted any leftover salmon. He and his friend made too much. He was holding it in tinfoil. He left and I slept in my car that night with a knife next to me. I probably overreacted, but seriously walking unannounced into a solo woman's campsite when there is absolutely no one else around is mad creepy and unnerving at that late hour. Probably didn't help that I was reading a book about a dude who kidnaps people. I can't think of any while car camping. Usually you get your peace and quiet and if not it's usually a nice neighborly environment. Playing frisbee or sharing a campfire dessert come to mind, but never saw anything I thought was untoward in 20 years of camping at state parks in Indiana. Honestly the only thing that comes close is in my local county park there was a lady who was there all summer long. I run at least one morning there every week, sometimes more. I spend a ton of time there all year round. Snowshowing, swimming, outdoor concerts, disc golf, etc. So from May until October I'm probably out there two to three days a week. So this one summer this lady who drove a big rig was camping there. She had the same campsite all summer long, and no matter what day or time I showed up there she was. Eventually she started making gumbo and selling bowls of it for $5. I thought this was weird as hell, but I bought a bowl and it was decent. I think pretty soon after the park told her she couldn't sell food, but she stay a few more weeks after that and eventually her semi was gone. That's literally the only abnormal story I can think of, and it's really not a big deal. She broke the park's rules, she stopped. End of story. I've only had one experience with someone that left me thinking something was very off. A few years ago my wife and I were camping up at Gold Bluffs Beach Campground in Northern California. It's a really nice campground that sites pretty much right on the beach, fairly small too, I think 25 sites or so. It's also fairly remote. You need to drive about 8 miles of dirt road to access it but keep in mind it's still a state parks campground so it's got all the amenities and such. Anyway, it was November so the campground was fairly empty, just a couple other groups. Around midday, this guy shows up and grabs the site next to ours. He arrived in a normal four-door sedan and had zero camping supplies with him. Around sunset, he came by and was talking to us. He said he was a teacher on some break and flew into OR and was just driving south for a few days for a break. He said he bought a sleeping bag from Walmart and was just planning to sleep in his car. He seemed normal enough when we talked to him, just kind of odd circumstances but figured whatever. He moved along and we didn't really see him the rest of the night. So later that night, around 10 to 11, I'm walking back from the bathroom, I always brush my teeth in the bathroom if I can camping don't know why, and I'm walking past this guy's side and all of a sudden he's behind me and says something, scarred the shit out of me, I'm also fairly drunk at this point in the evening. So I start talking to him for a little bit and I don't know what it was but I just got an extremely bad feeling talking to this guy. Something about him seemed off and really sketchy. At one point he says, oh I have something for you and goes in the trunk of his car, I remember thinking this dude is gonna pull out an axe or some shit. He hands me a pack of toilet paper, ha, go figure. So I wrap up the conversation, wish him good night, and head to my tent. Kept the knife right by my head that night. In the middle of the night, I get woken up by what I swear was something walking around our tent. There's a decent chance it could have been a critter too, there's plenty of skunks and foxes in the area. The next morning I wake up pretty early, like 6am, and he's gone. I always think back and wonder, Either he was really just a lonely guy who was out on a random trip and was just kind of weird or dude was a serial killer or something and was looking for a victim. I've never got that vibe I got from that dude from anyone before. Never had another weird experience camping in my life aside from that one but I always think about it when we're camping now and take a look around to see what kind of folks are nearby. Nowadays it's mostly families though it seems.
One night, years ago when the wife and I were dating, we were sitting by the fire and were pretty tipsy when across the way we heard a dog screaming. I jumped up and was headed over to the other campsite when I saw the silhouette of a bunch of people standing around a fire while one guy was beating a large dog. I'm not a fighter, meaning I was too scared to confront six to eight people while alcohol is involved on both sides, I assume they were drinking as well. We went to bed with our own dog that night feeling shitty from what we had seen and our lack of intervention. The next morning while walking our dog, the guy was walking his own dog towards us on the same path. All I can think of is vengeance. I started calling that mother f out as I walked towards him but as I get closer I see his palms up towards me and a messed up looking dog. He quickly explained how his dog was old and sick and she fell in the fire and he was putting the flames out. He also said they've been thinking of putting her down but decided on a last camping trip before they did it. We all had a little cry and wished him the best of luck. I was in the national forest a few back at my favorite dispersed site. There was a large group across from us. I had just purchased a rifle so I was trying it out when one of our neighbors came charging across the creek that separates us. He then begins to tell me that it was illegal to shoot in that area. I respond by telling him I was in the same exact spot several weeks before when a ranger pulled up and told me it was fine to shoot there. These people were drinking and probably doing meth into the early morning hours. The next day, one of them came into my camp again trying to intimidate me and trying to start a fight. At that point I told them stay out of my camp or suffer the consequences. I eventually packed up and moved because that is not why I go to the mountains and dispersed camp. It was a holiday weekend. Was backpacking with two friends when three very backwoods looking hunters came into our campsite. They were of course armed while we weren't. They stood there acting sketchy and circling in closer and closer to us kind of hurting us into a smaller circle if you will. They asked a ton of questions about where we parked, how long were we staying, was there anyone else with us? Lots of abnormal shit. No normal small talk all questions gauging our situation. We were very brief and made it clear we were just relaxing. We tried to politely usher them out of our sight but they lingered well past the uncomfortable point. They finally left without incident, I barely slept that night. I've not camped unarmed since. Me and about 8 other high school friends went camping. We were all 16 or 17. We went on some crown land, about an hour and a half up some logging roads. Around 5 p.m. we heard some gunshots off in the distance. However, this is a common place to hunt so we didn't think too much about it. A half hour goes by and we are greeted by two very large men on quads. They have a couple of dogs with them. It looks as though they are a father and son but I can't say for sure. Both quite overweight, with large beards. The only big difference between them was one had a grey beard. Only the man with the grey beard spoke to us. He told us that there was a bear in the area and they were firing off shots to scare it off. We thanked him for the heads up and they were off up the road. We could still hear the shots going off for about 20 minutes or so. Later that night around 11 pm, we were all sitting around the fire. It's pitch black all around us. The two dogs come running into our campsite. They were running all over the place. It took us a minute to realize they were the dogs from earlier. Soon after the younger of the two men appears out of the dark. He was on foot and barely made a sound as he was slowly illuminated by the camp fire light. We were all a little rattled, it wasn't the kind of camping where you expect someone to show up uninvited. He said something along the lines of just wanted to see how you guys were making out. He had a beer in his hand. One of my buddies told him to pull up a seat, so he did. I don't think he was even there for 5 minutes when he looks across the fire and asks my friend what would you do if I got up and threw you in the fire? With a quick response my buddy answered back I'd be more concerned about what everyone else would be doing to you. Another friend chimes in, I think you better be going now. The guy stands up and bursts into laughter. Turns around walks into the dark laughing hysterically. It was one of the creepiest things I've experienced hearing his laugh get fader as he got farther away. We were all like what the f was that about? 
We all slept with a pocket knife or a hatchet that night. Woke up the next morning, packed up and got the hell out of there. The worst experience I have ever had camping was a time at a state park where a couple of co-workers and I were camping at a large spot where the three of us could spread out. It was a lakeside site in a grassy area, and we were sitting around in the dark just chatting. Three guys in a truck drove down into this area where we were, which was quite secluded. The sat in the truck for a while, smoking pot and talking. We stayed still and silent, trying to figure out what they were going to do. Eventually they got out of the truck and walked right through our campsite, saying some pretty vulgar things about us. They walked up into the rocks behind us and started howling. Yes, howling. We grabbed anything important, left our tents, and drove to the other side of the lake. Looked for a camp host. No one was around. We waited until we saw their truck leave, and then we went back for our tents and set up camp on the other side of the lake. Later, Around 2 to 3 a.m. or so, we had people drive by to sneak in and go fishing by our new site. It was an extremely unpleasant experience and an uneasy night of sleep. Camping in northeastern Kentucky, specifically in the Red River Gorge or Daniel Boone National Park, we had set up at a moderately advanced tent camping site. It was secluded, the only flat spot for miles requiring a strenuous, nearly 90-degree, three-story climb to reach. Despite its seclusion, it wasn't far from the trailhead. So, around 3 in the morning, we were startled by loud bass music at the trailhead, followed shortly by hooting and hollering from the trail. We were all in our tents, trying to sleep. The shouts of toe up from the flow up. And nasty natty. Grew closer and closer. It was puzzling because the five of us had arrived in three cars, all parked at the trailhead, and other than scenic views, no camping spots except ours were accessible from this trail. How did they not see the cars? Sure enough, after the sounds of drunk individuals somehow managing the three-story climb in the dark, we heard, someone's at the spot. Followed by, what? And then, somebody is at the spot. They were absolutely screaming at each other. They backtracked about 30 feet up the trail and apparently set up camp in the scrub growth. The sounds of chopping wood, in a national park, and drunken singing floated up to us until about 5 am. Finally, the noise ceased, suggesting they had passed out. Or had they? In our camp, merely 20 feet from my tent door, I overheard two individuals dangling their feet over the cliff, making no attempt to be quiet. Eventually, Resigning myself to the fact that I wouldn't get any sleep, I got dressed and approached them. They were surprisingly cordial but went on to tell me that two weeks prior, they had been at this spot, got caught in the rain, and had set all of their gear on fire and thrown it over the cliff. I initially thought they were joking, but upon looking over the cliff, I could just make out the charred remains of tents and sleeping bags littering the rocks below. For a moment, I contemplated retaliating but decided it wasn't worth it. The next day, after managing to get a little sleep, we packed up and hiked out. These individuals had cut down a fairly large live tree and were attempting to burn it. As we were driving out, we noticed a significant number of Ohio license plates, nasty natty, and decided it would be a while before we returned. I have been camping since I was as small as a grasshopper, I'm 48 now, and only twice have I had creepy encounters. The first time was at Oswald West, outside of Cannon Beach on the Oregon coast. I went there with my father on a Monday to pick the spot I wanted because that place would always fill up. It's worth noting that it's roughly a mile hike to the campsites and the rangers leave at dark. My dad left on Wednesday, and I had friends coming to camp on Friday. I stayed by myself until then with no issues. When Friday arrived, my friends, all girls, got off work and drove to Oswald West. By the time they arrived, it was dark. They called me to let me know they were close and asked me to meet them at the trailhead. I had everything, all their tents and whatnot, already there and set up, so all they were bringing were their sleeping bags. We hiked back to the campgrounds and reached the bathrooms, where all of them mentioned they needed to use the restroom, so they did. One comes out, 
and I said I was going to use the restroom too. Inside the bathroom, I could hear the girls talking to someone outside. When I came out, two guys were there, one skinny, scraggly guy and one very large man, telling them something. I approached them, and the skinny guy was flashing a fake toy badge, saying the girls needed to come with them because the campground was full. I firmly told them my friends were going nowhere with them, they were with me, and I had been there all week and had never seen them. The larger man asked to see my receipt. I had the girls walk down the trail to my campground ahead of me and told my fiancé to get everyone to the farthest part of the campsite while I fetched the receipt from the tent. The men followed us to the entrance path of the site. The girls went to the back of the site, I grabbed my receipt and my hatchet, and when I came out, the girls were terrified. I walked back towards where the two men had been, and they were gone. It was incredibly sketchy. We never saw the two rangers again, and the next day, I reported the incident to the actual rangers, who said I had done the right thing and that they would keep a lookout. And that was the next year, but not the same person. The second time, I was rafting and camping down the Deschutes River with a group of about eight guys and three rafts. We were all up late drinking and playing cards. I knew some were planning on going fishing at daybreak, but I told them I wanted to sleep in because I'm lazy, and this was after a week of work. In the morning, I heard some rustling at the front of my tent and said, I'm going to sleep longer and will make more coffee when I get up. After rolling over to go back to bed, there was more rustling, then the front of my tent started unzipping. I sat up in my sleeping bag, thinking, what the heck? And there was a deer head poking through the front of my tent, just staring at me. It was as surprised as I was and quickly took off, but waking up to a deer head at my front door just staring at me was creepy as heck. The deer actually lingered about 10 minutes at the edge of the campsite. Obviously, people had been feeding it. Please don't feed the deer. This isn't creepy but it was something. In July 2021 my friend and I did a trip to Grand Teton and Yellowstone. Halfway through the trip we were staying at Canyon Campground in Yellowstone National Park. The sites around us were empty until about 9.30 to 10 p.m. until a passenger van arrived with a group of six people along with their camping gear. They made a big dinner and weren't too noisy but afterwards they decided to have a fire in the fire ring. They had some wood that they had bought but they had also gathered a handful of dead twigs and bigger branches, which you're not supposed to do when within a nation park campground. Due to the wood and area being so dry the fire started quite quickly but they still piled all of their collected branches on with some wood. Their campsite had a lot of lowish hanging tree branches over the fire ring and since the fire was so high the top of the flames were approaching the branches. I decided to go over with one of my gallon water jugs we bought for the trip to help them out. I went over to their campsite and learned that most of them didn't speak English very well and that this was their first time camping and that they had just driven there from Salt Lake City in their rental van. As I was over there talking to the person in the group that spoke the best English a campground host came by to help with the fire as they noticed it was too big. And the campground host poured water on the fire and moved the branches around so the fire wasn't as big. Again, not a creepy story just kind of like a wow moment. It wouldn't have been good if one of the tree branches caught fire. The first time I ever considered an alien was real or anything was when I was 19 when my boyfriend and I have a few years lived in Canada. We woke up one day like normal, had breakfast, sat down and I'll never forget his face. I thought he was having a brain aneurysm or something and I, obviously panicking, asked what's wrong? He shakily said. I just remembered something and I don't know how to explain it. He had tears running down his face, shaking like a leaf, and after I held him for a few minutes he started talking. He is a Native American and a strong man who is almost a genius IQ, who doesn't smoke, drink, or use drugs, and who doesn't believe in ghosts or any of that paranormal stuff. He told me he woke up in bed and two aliens were walking in the room. He was screaming trying to wake me up. He said they were the typical grey aliens but had long arms and no genitalia. He said they came into the room with their hands out like to give us a high five. He told me when he was screaming, it was like I couldn't hear him at all and I am a soft sleeper. 
He said one alien came over and kept a hand over the top of me while the other one walked towards him with his hands up. He said he heard this hum and it was putting him in a trance, no matter how hard he fought it. The alien was on top of him until he passed out. I ended up finding out I was pregnant not long after and the conception date the doctor gave us was around that night. We did a lot of research but he couldn't handle it. He always shook and would become overwhelmed any time he heard a weird hum that reminded him of it or anything. We assumed maybe they were implanting their DNA into our baby. Trying to crossbreed or maybe taking our eggs or sperm. But that was that, and I didn't think about it again until three years later after we broke up for a while. I still blame that incident for our breakup. Like it was a reminder of that traumatic memory. After we broke up he refused to talk about it. I started having sleep paralysis and weird sleep issues and never thought much about it until I started being aware. Once I forced myself to be aware of what's truly happened I realized that I was being abducted. A lot. The normal stories you hear and read don't really match. But what I know is that they can control us while we are sleeping and weak. When we are sleeping they telepathically can control us by forcing us back to sleep or paralyzing us. After two years of being aware I started to get really good at fighting their forced sleep or paralysis. They've actually gotten angry and threatened me telepathically to stop and that I need to not make it harder on them. Also if I just go to sleep I won't be scared anymore. If I want to move again just fall back asleep and I will wake up just fine. To my knowledge, if you break out of the trance they are told to leave because it makes it dangerous and hard to control us. Every time I overpower them they always just leave. I now know when they come in my room and I can normally wake up. Some sort of defense mechanism I assume. But that has caused many other issues. I now think they are using harsher methods when trying to take me. Anyways they do not like for us to see them so they try to attack our backs. Stand over our back or behind us. I have now set up my bed so they have to walk to the side of me in front of my TV which I always have on because I continue to try to see them. I am now scared of the dark. One recent night I had a horrible sleep. My body kept telling me they were coming. I never did this before but I turned on my phone. And recorded. It was two hours of recording and it was raining outside. I woke up paralyzed like usual and I opened an eye and saw the shadow in the corner of my TV and fought my hardest to get out of my paralysis. It only took me a second and I lifted my head up looked right at it and it vanished. So I went to watch my recording to see if I could hear or see anything at the moment I saw it. The minute before I broke free from my sleep and picked up my phone to see if anything was on it I could clearly hear a humming beat like a heartbeat in the background. I can hear the beat start around 30 seconds into the clip. I can provide an entire recording of an hour and so for authenticity as well. My only guess is that's the sound wave they may use to control us during our sleep I am not sure. I have a lot more I would like to try to remember by hypnosis and I know they will be back. I honestly believe they have human women carry children as crossbreeds because their reproduction systems have slowly been failing. We carry them for a month or two in our wombs and then take them out. And can somehow keep them alive from then on with their technology. I have been consistently feeling pregnant on and off for a year. My breasts fill up huge and are tender. I have acne cravings and weight gain. I hope to personally demand to know more about what these creatures are doing and why they are taking me. This is the first time contacting anyone because this is the first time I have any sort of proof. This happened several years ago when I was about 11 years old. I was in a wooded 100 acre ranch in northern New. My family owns the property and we have family reunions every year and all stay for about 5 days to camp. There's an area of the ranch where we all set up camp and cook and eat. Getting to that part of the ranch requires driving through a small village and several gates for about 2 miles. The first gate beyond the village is slightly past a set of railroad tracks. That's a lot of description, but it's relevant later in the story. Because I had been camping at the ranch for as long as I could remember and the land was private, my parents would allow me to go off on my own during the day as long as I didn't go too far. I'd spend time walking the property near our camp area looking for arrowheads or trying to catch tadpoles in the ponds. On this day, I left the large camp area after lunch, which was around 11.30, and told my mom I was going to a nearby creek. 
I planned on catching some tadpoles to bring back to camp and be back on time for a swimming trip my cousins were planning. They wanted to go to a nearby river and I really didn't want to miss it. I made it down to the creek and got several tadpoles. I probably spent a total of 15 minutes down there. To get back to camp, I would have needed to either climb up a relatively steep embankment with a lot of loose rock or circle around on a longer route with a flat trail. I'd usually go up the embankment, but I didn't have a top for the water bottle I caught the tadpoles with and didn't want to risk slipping and spilling them out or killing them. I had never walked the longer trail by myself, but I had with my dad and felt confident I could find my way back to camp on it. As I walked back to camp, I had my head down looking for arrowheads in the washed out areas of the trail. I started feeling a little creeped out as I continued walking. We all know that feeling like someone is watching. It was unsettling, but I chalked it up to just getting spooked being on the trail by myself. Now the next part, I can't explain whatsoever. It's as if a light switch was turned on or someone snapped their fingers and I came back to reality. Except when I came to, I wasn't on the trail I had been on before. I was near the railroad tracks and it was completely dark. My mom was standing in front of me shaking my shoulders and yelling, where were you? Two things I remember really clearly about the moments I came to are. 1. The look of fear, anger, relief in my mom's tearful eyes as she was yelling at me, and 2. The confusion I felt about what the hell was going on. The last thing I remembered was walking on the trail back to camp, and now suddenly it was dark and I was at the railroad tracks leading to the ranch, which was over 2 miles away. The best way I can describe it is to compare it to the movie The Butterfly Effect. The main character would be living in one moment, then suddenly he'd wake up somewhere entirely different. My parents drove me back to camp and I learned it was 10.30 pm this meant I had been gone for 11 hours, about 10 of which I can't account for to this day. My parents and all my family had understandably freaked the hell out when I hadn't returned to camp. They had been looking for me all day. I was a really good kid growing up and rarely broke any rules, so my parents were baffled at my behavior. I tried to explain to them that I had no memory of getting to the tracks, but they didn't believe me. They thought maybe I got lost and was embarrassed to admit it. This was the only time I've ever experienced something like this. I can't explain how unsettling it is to not be able to account for all those hours I was gone. Was it a coincidence that I had that creeped out feeling on the trail and then just lost 10 hours of my life? I wish I had answers for what happened. Story time. I worked for the National Park Service in Idaho, specifically at Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve. The preserve is incredibly remote, about two hours from a town with only one store that's accessible by dirt roads through the mountains. We have a lot of interactions with people who live out there, they can't easily get anything else. I joke that it feels like we're running a small city at times, due to all the programs we've got going on simultaneously. So, while working up there, I had this experience happen twice, once in November of 2011 and again in January of 2012. This post will be long, so bear with me. In November, a co-worker and I were exploring the preserve during the day in my SUV. We came across a small cave area where we decided to stop. The road here was very rough, but it allowed us to get close enough that we could hike in without too much difficulty. This cave was relatively small, maybe 7 feet tall at its tallest point, and about 15 feet wide, rough estimates. We walked around outside of it for a short time before going inside, only briefly. The second we did, I'll never forget the feeling of dread I had when my coworker stopped dead in his tracks, staring straight ahead. He looked at me with pure terror on his face, and just muttered the words, no way. I asked what was wrong, thinking something had happened to him, but he just stood there, looking right at me, shaking his head no. I turned around to see what my coworker was staring at, and saw a very large beast hunched over by a large boulder about 8 feet away. We must have surprised it. When I turned around to look at it, it stood up straight in surprise. When I saw the size of the creature, and what it was doing in that cave, I just about pissed my pants. It was bent over, licking the blood off a deer skull, with its back and long, 
hairless arms ending in huge claws that were bigger than my hands. Have you ever seen Star Wars? This thing reminded me of a darn rancor, at least the way it looked a different head and face, but the hands and claws were almost identical. And the way it held onto that skull, it makes me shudder just to think about it. The teeth looked like something out of a nightmare, longer than fangs, with a huge mouth. Its skin was almost grayish white, with muscles bulging in its chest, neck and head. I can't even think of the words to describe how scary this was, and to think it was only about 10 feet away. I'll never forget that feeling. It reacted to our movements and started moving towards us. My coworker was shaking so badly, I had to snap him back to reality, grabbing him by the arm and pulling him out. We had no time to ask questions or speculate on what it could have been. After this thing had taken a couple of steps towards us, we were already out and far, far away. I'm not sure what this was, what it wanted, or if we had somehow stumbled upon its temporary den. Maybe it was trying to protect its kill. Who knows? The drive to Algonquin Park lasted longer than expected. After running into traffic and making a few wrong turns along the way, we got there late in the afternoon. My dad paid the fees at the front gate and proceeded to drive the remaining kilometers into the park. We eventually found our way to the canoe launch and got out of the van, stretching our legs. My dad and Uncle Steve were looking over the maps which appeared to have been hand-drawn by park rangers and were encased in clear plastic. I watched as they traced the route we would be traveling. They both agreed that it shouldn't be too complicated to make it to the campground, despite the fact that we had been delayed getting there. Little bit late in the day to start a portaging trip, said a park ranger to my dad, as we were packing the last of our camping supplies into the canoes. We're meeting up with some friends who are out there waiting for us. They've already set up camp, so we've just got to make it to the island. Well, be careful. Once it gets dark in Algonquin it becomes a whole different world. You folks be safe now. Thanks, we will. My dad had lectured us the whole way there in a similar fashion, and I couldn't help but grin to hear him getting a taste of his own medicine. Apparently there were people who got lost in the park every year, never to be seen again. There were bears and wolves, coyotes and other animals in the wilderness, and we would be guests in their domain. I climbed into the front of one boat, and my uncle took a seat at the back. My brother was in the other canoe, and my dad climbed in awkwardly, nearly tipping it over in the process. The water was crystal clear and pristine, and I could see minnows swimming in the shallows, frogs and tadpoles. I took a deep breath in, enjoying the crisp fresh air of the northern outdoors, and admired a great blue heron that was resting in the shade nearby. Paddling along the river, we found our way towards a lake which opened up before us, revealing our first glimpse at the pristine beauty of the provincial park. The silence was overwhelming, away from car mufflers and computer fans and the constant noise of the city. The sense of sudden peace was overwhelming. All I could hear was the sound of my paddle slicing through the calm water, and the occasional call of a bird from the surrounding pine forest that engulfed us. Other trees and plant life lined the lake as well. Maples and white birches. Some pale-looking twisted trees sprang from the high cliffs above, growing against all odds, their roots hanging on from rocky outcrops that ranged in rusty reddish colors. My brother Noel and my dad were struggling with their canoe coordination. Noel and I frequently went fishing using the canoes at our cabin when we went up there, so I knew he wasn't the one having issues, it was my dad. My dad had never operated a canoe before, I realized in that moment. Although he'd spoken confidently saying he knew what he was doing, he was struggling. He had insisted on sitting in the rear of the canoe, which is the most crucial position in the boat since you act as the rudder, and also the primary source of power. Noel was fruitlessly paddling away up front, while my dad lackadaisically slapped at the water, sending the boat veering back and forth in a zigzag pattern. His ineffectual efforts eventually caused Noel to get slightly annoyed, and I heard them bickering with each other. I looked back at them trailing far behind us and saw their twisting, 
turning path was taking them all over the lake, whereas we were traveling in more or less a straight line. Has your dad ever paddled a canoe before? Steve asked. I think it's been a while by the looks of it. Oh boy, maybe he should let Noel steer. Yeah, I'll suggest it at the first stop. We arrived at the first place where we had to portage across a short stretch. For those who aren't familiar, this means you have to carry your canoe across dry land for a little ways to get to the next river or lake, so that you can continue your trip. If you have a cooler and luggage and other items, you have to hike back and forth sometimes two or three times. This is when it comes in handy to pack light. It took us two trips to bring everything, including the canoes, to the other side. The hike between lakes was about 10 minutes, so it wasn't too strenuous. That was the easy one, according to the map, my uncle Steve said. The next one is much further. Great, I thought to myself. I guess it'll be my job to carry the cooler again too. We got back in the carved wooden boats and started paddling once more. My uncle had the map and was directing us which way to go, while my brother followed with my dad in the other canoe. At least he had managed to get him to switch seats though. As we went along, I saw they were now keeping pace with us, with Noel at the rear of the boat generating more power, and his more experienced paddling keeping them on course. What do you guys know about the legends of the Algonquin? My uncle asked us, making conversation. He and my dad both had a wealth of knowledge on various topics, but things like this were my uncle's specialty. He was an avid outdoorsman and a skilled fisherman, who took a deep interest in Aboriginal culture, and the stories they told over generations. Nothing, really, I said. So you've never heard of the Memiguesi? We all stayed silent and waited for him to explain. My uncle was a bit of a jokester as well, so it was hard to tell if he was kidding sometimes. He liked to put on a straight face and tell an elaborate lie in the form of a story, just to take you along for the ride. So we waited to see if he was trying to fool us before answering yes or no. They're water spirits, mischievous little buggers. They'll steal your camping supplies if you're not careful. Food, clothes, fishing rods, whatever they like. And they can send your canoe off course too. You'll be just paddling along like we are now, and the Memiguesi will send you off from the proper course, and you'll wind up lost. If you don't show them the proper respect, that is. Okay, enough with that Steve. Quit trying to scare the kids with that crap. We're barely gonna make it to the campsite before dark as it is. Turn right up ahead here. The map says it's going to be over this way. We veered our boats over in that direction at my dad's insistence, and I noticed we were in a very shallow section full of reeds and plants. The canoes were almost touching the bottom of the lake. Should we go this way? I don't think that's what the map is saying. My uncle was looking at the narrow river doubtfully. The area we were headed towards looked like a swamp, and mosquitoes were already beginning to land on me and bite my neck as we got closer. My dad and uncle pondered over the map for a while and my brother, and I sat there and slapped at the bugs landing on us. Eventually they decided to take the route which led us down the shallow, winding river, surrounded by tall reeds. I could tell by the silence of them both that they were not sure if this way was correct. The further we got, and the more time passed, I noticed the sun had begun to set. Pretty soon it was almost dark outside, and the water eventually became so shallow that it nearly dried up. The river had turned into a muddy creek, and we were forced to turn around. Ah uh oh, my dad said. We must have gone the wrong way. We'll have to go back to that lake. I think I read the map wrong. My uncle bit his tongue, and we paddled back against the current. The lake was empty, and it was completely dark by the time we got back to it. There was no moon that night and nothing to light our way. My dad told me to get out a flashlight and cast the beam toward shore, looking for a reflective sign with a symbol for a portage point. Just keep that flashlight pointed at the shore, and tell us if you see a reflective sign anywhere, Jordan. This next portage should take us to the lake with the campsite, so there shouldn't be too much farther to go after we find it. 
My heartbeat was quickening with anxious fear as our canoes traveled along near the shore in almost total darkness. I swung the flashlight beam around to check for dead heads and rocks in our path, and told my uncle to veer left or right to avoid hitting things that would have tipped us over. We gotta be careful, don't want to fall into these waters. There's another legend that the people of this area used to speak of, my uncle said while he paddled, trying to distract us from the precarious situation we had gotten ourselves into. The Miss Hijinibig. It's a huge horned serpent. It lives in lakes. And eats people. Okay Steve, that's about enough. My dad was yelling when my ears caught a sound that I couldn't place. It was steady and persistent, coming from just ahead. RSSHHH. The canoes were picking up speed. I looked back and saw that my dad and uncle weren't paddling, weren't paying attention at all, they were just arguing with each other about who had taken the wrong turn. You and your ridiculous legends, you're distracting us all with this, this, useless garbage. Don't say that. You're going to upset them. You should apologize. I finally managed to find my voice, and I yelled back at them. There's a waterfall up ahead. We're paddling towards a waterfall. They chuckled and told me that was ridiculous. There was no waterfall on the map. Then they began to bicker again, and I started to get extremely nervous. The canoes were moving faster and faster, but nobody was paddling anymore. I was just a kid so they weren't listening to me. Can't you see what's happening? I yelled at them. Look how fast we're moving, there's a waterfall up ahead. They abruptly stopped arguing, and now the sound of rushing water could be distinctly heard from up ahead. Okay, let's start paddling toward shore. I think we need to start paddling toward shore right now. My dad was trying to sound calm, but I could hear the panic in his voice. We all began to paddle as hard as we could. In the dim light I could barely see anything but the silhouette of trees all around us, and the ink-black water of the lake. Shimmering reflections of stars were floating on the surface of it, speeding past at an increasing rate. We began to make some headway, getting closer to the shoreline, but then suddenly our efforts became futile. We were being sucked in, drawn inextricably towards the waterfall. I looked ahead and saw it, drawing close. The night sky sat surreally above the surface of the turbulent black water, which flowed downwards, disappearing from sight. And when I saw how close it was, I screamed. Watching in horror, I saw us go over the edge, and the world tipped sickeningly upside down as I fell. Becoming weightless was a harrowing experience as for a moment I floated through the air, my screams echoing out into the night. The wolves howled in response and I descended, looking down to see jagged rocks waiting for us below. Far, far, far down below. We fell and our screams echoed across the lake. I tried to point my feet downwards, afraid of what might happen if I impacted the water incorrectly. After what felt like forever, I landed in the frigid depths below. The surface of it hit me with so much force that it nearly knocked the wind out of me, and I struggled to breathe as I gasped from the cold, sinking downwards. The weight of my boots dragged me below and I kicked, trying to get them off my feet. They felt like cinder blocks, and as my head dipped beneath the surface of the water I gulped it in, and it went up my nose, stinging my sinuses. I called out for help, but my pleas were drowned by the water once more. My head went under again, and this time I stayed down longer. Struggling to get back to the surface, I looked around in the murky water, and saw a pair of eyes glaring back at me from the depths. Yellow eyes that were unblinking and massive, glowing in the darkness. A tipped over canoe was close by when I got to the surface, and I grabbed hold of it, and took a gasping breath of air. My dad and brother were okay, I saw. And my uncle had survived the fall too, although his head sustained a large gash, and he appeared dazed and hurt. You need to apologize Dave, my uncle told my father, sounding drunk now, his words slurred and difficult to understand. You've disrespected the spirits here apologize before they kill us all. What? Those stories you were telling to scare the kids? Are you still talking about that shit? Suddenly I felt something wrap around my ankle, 
And although I held on to the canoe as firmly as I could, I felt myself being dragged down. There was no time to scream, but I tried to take a breath of air before being pulled down below. My uncle's hand reached down and managed to grab mine, and he held on to me for dear life. I felt like I would be pulled in two as the thing from the depths tore at my leg, yanking me downwards. As the time passed beneath the water, my need to breathe became more urgent. I began to thrash and kick my legs, trying desperately to free myself from the thing which was pulling me down. My heartbeat was loud and fast in my ears, and I looked in terror to see the yellow eyes of the thing were very close now. It was coming towards me, and in the black murky water I could just barely make out its massive horn head and gaping maw. Huge fangs and a split tongue could be seen in the dim light, as the snake came face to face with me. The massive beast was so large, it could swallow me whole, I realized, and I cringed and waited for that to happen, momentarily resigned to my fate. But then a light shone down from the surface. A bright torch lamp made the snake cringe and recoil in fear. It loosened its grip on my leg, and I felt my uncle pull me towards the surface. My vision was clouding red and black, and as I began to feel like I was passing out, I broke through the surface of the water, and was pulled up onto a large canoe. Our friends who had been at the campsite waiting for our arrival, had heard us screaming as we went over the waterfall. The campsite was close by, and they had quickly gotten in their boat to come rescue us once they realized what had happened. If not for them we would have been dead. At least so it seemed. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm so, so sorry. My dad was repeating the words over and over. It's not your fault Dave. These things happen, his friend Randy was saying, as we paddled over towards the campsite. At least nobody got hurt, right? That's the important thing. My uncle rubbed his bleeding forehead, and rolled his eyes at me. Thanks, Uncle Steve, I said to him quietly. He nodded and said, No problem kiddo. I saw the horned serpent down there, Uncle Steve. I think you're right. We should probably be respectful of the creatures around here. I don't want to get on that guy's bad side again. He smiled, his eyes shining red for just a second in the moonlight, and I noticed his face appeared different, like someone else entirely. A being which had been sent to help us, both ancient and wise. Just wait until I tell you the tale of the great rabbit. I've got plenty of stories, and each with a lesson. For those who will listen, and who have ears to hear. He put two fingers up over his head, making little bunny ears, and smiled. I've been working as a wildlife officer at the Okfenoki State Park since 2010. It's a pretty great job, if I'm being honest. I've always loved nature, and being from the area the heat and humidity never bothered me. There's been some strange stuff going on lately though. The job doesn't involve a whole lot, mostly just patrolling the swamps to make sure nobody is hunting illegally, and keeping an eye out for any possible fire hazards during the summer months. Really it's just a peaceful place to be, assuming you keep plenty of bug spray on you at all times. I've been on the overnight shift for the last few weeks, while the regular officer is out on paternity leave. Before he left he told me I would probably see a few weird things typical around the Florida or Georgia line. Method out rednecks, kids sneaking off into the swamp to bang, and the swamp lights. The first two were typical on day shift too, so I wasn't worried about that. The swamp lights threw me for a loop though. The lights are an old superstition. Supposedly it's spirits of lost souls that have died in the swamp, trying to lure others to a watery death. There's a natural explanation for it though. Methane and phosphorus gas from the swamp mixes, and gives off a glow. It actually looks pretty cool after the first scare it gives you. Those aren't the scariest thing that's been happening though. I was out on one of my patrols a couple of weeks ago in the big fan boat that we use to get around the areas where boardwalks haven't been built in, and I noticed something huge floating in the water not far from me. I steered over that way and focused my spotlight onto it. It was an alligator. Well, it used to be an alligator at one time. This one had been a monster, 
at least 15 feet long and built like truck. Looked like something that crawled out of Jurassic Park. It had been torn to shreds, gashes all along the length of its body, and the head was barely hanging on. Hey, Captain, I said into my radio. What's going on, Smith? The captain answered back into the radio. She was stationed back at the main office at the swamp entrance. We always kept at least two people on shift in case of any accidents, or the rare wildlife attack. I've got a dead gator out here in section 14. I said back. I picked up a branch from nearby and started poking the corpse in the water, trying to flip it around and see if there were any other distinguishing marks. Probably just one of the older ones out there. Nature will sort it out. Captain answered back. Dead animals were nothing new in the swamp, especially with the amount of wildlife out here, but this was something I had never seen before. Negative cap. This gator is a giant, and it's been ripped apart. Ripped apart? By what? She sounded surprised, couldn't say I blamed her. Beats the shit out of me. I said. I still couldn't tell whether it had been torn apart by claws or teeth. The head had been ripped though, the skin was stretched and the bones were sticking out in jagged pikes. I'm getting the hell out of here before it comes back though. You think one of the bears might have done it? Old Methuselah's been a bit more crotchety than usual lately. Methuselah was a black bear that had been tagged in the swamp back in the late 80s. He was the oldest bear we had on record out here, and was somewhat of a local celebrity. He mostly kept to himself, and seemed to get along with most of the gators in the swamp, usually swimming along beside them most of the time. No way Methuselah could have done this. I said back into the radio. I'm heading back to the office. No, head over to the cabin. If there's something big out there, I don't want you out in the open at night. Head in and wait until it's light out, we'll come get you. F. I hated the old cabins. We had a few spreads out throughout the swamp because of how large it was. Mostly they were used as ranger outposts now, but they started out as little hunting cabins back in the early 19s. They were small, and up on huge stilts to keep them out of the water, plus to make sure the black bears didn't wander into them, and make a nice little home. I headed over to the nearest one, about a 20 minute ride in the boat. The whole way over I was going over what in the world could have torn that gator apart. Usually they're pretty docile. There's plenty of food for them out here, so one wouldn't have any reason to attack a bear for food, and a bear is the only thing out here big enough to have done that. The only ones out here are black bears anyway, and they're more likely to run than fight. I coasted up to the cabin and stopped the boat fan, pulling it toward the nearest stilt and tying it down. With the sound of the fan not overtaking my hearing, I started to notice just how quiet it was. Usually there were cicadas, frogs, crickets, and all kinds of other wildlife making noise all over the swamp. Now I didn't even hear the usual owls in the trees. It was like everything had run away. Once everything was tied down I grabbed onto the ladder, and started the climb up into the cabin. I pushed open the small trap door and pulled myself into the cabin. It smelled like mildew and dirt, but at least it was a safe place to sleep, out of reach of any dangerous animals. I looked around the cabin until I finally found the generator in the corner. Luckily we have someone come out to these once a month and replace all the gas and make sure nothing has chewed through the wiring. I would actually have light and some air conditioning so tonight wouldn't be too bad. That's when I realized the gas canister was mostly empty. They must have forgotten to hit this one last month. Shit. I still have a supply of batteries down in the boat, and we keep some small lanterns around. But it wouldn't be nearly as good as having all the lights on the cabin. I looked out the window into the swamp. There was a bright light coming from about 50 feet away. It looked too bright to be one of the swamp lights. Hey captain, I said into my radio. You got somebody coming out to me right now. You and I are the only ones out here tonight. She said back. Ain't nobody coming out there until sun come threes up. More lights started to pop up near the first one. They were spaced out, but all just as bright. There's lights out there captain. I think they're moving toward me. 
I tried to hide the shakiness in my voice. The lights were getting closer. Just hang tight, try to get some slee. The radio cut out with a high-pitched burst of static. Shit. Cap. Cap can you hear me? It was useless. The only thing coming through was a low buzz of static. I looked at my watch. It was only 11.19 pm. I had at least 8 hours before someone would be out here. The scream started a few minutes later. It sounded like a child, the screams when a kid falls and scrapes their knee, and don't know what to do about it. They were anguished. They were coming from the direction of the lights. F this. I said to myself. I'm not sticking around for this shit. I grabbed a lantern and the flare gun off the wall, and pulled up the trapdoor to get onto the ladder. I practically jumped down to the boat, and started to unit it from the stilts. I reached down to the engine to pull the cord. It was gone. The pull cord had been cut off, there was no way to get the fan going. I'm stuck here. The screams grew louder, and I turned to see the lights only a few feet away. I hightailed my ass up the ladder. I could hear something ripping at the boat behind me as I closed the trap door. I heard the splinter of on of the stilts and felt the cabin sway. I've got my cell phone and my signal comes and goes. I'm going to try and keep updates going as I can. I've got every lamp in the cabin on, and I'm sitting in a corner as far away from any of the windows as I can get. The screaming has stopped, but I can see the glow of the lights coming in through one of the windows. If you're reading this, send help. Part 2. According to the clock and calendar we keep in the cabin, I've been here for two days. Not that I would be able to tell, seeing as the sun hasn't come out this entire time. It's been dark since I got here that night. The only light I've seen is from those Gotham swamp lights out there, and they've been coming and going as they please. I still don't know what they are, but I know there's something else out there with them. I've been trying to sleep since I've been here, not like I have the ability to do much else. The boat is trashed, one of the stilts of the cabin is splintered, and I sure as hell can't swim out of here. I was looking out the window last night, between naps, and saw something moving between the lights that were out there. It was big, at least the size of a SUV. It around the perimeter around the cabin, walking on four legs. It wasn't a bear, I knew that. We didn't have any bears that size in the swamp. I hope to whatever gods are listening that it isn't a gator. I can't get too good of a look at it with how it's weaving in between the swamp lights but I saw it knock over a tree on its way through. So, here we are, two days stuck in this shithole of a cabin, surrounded by floating lights that scream, and whatever biological nightmare shambling around out there. I know some people asked why I didn't call the captain using my cell. You really think I didn't try that? I just get a busy signal. I've tried sending out text and messages too, but they all just show read. I haven't gotten anything back. I really hope someone can tell the captain that I'm out here. If they ask, I'm in the section 1418 cabin, out near the gator bog. Holy shit. It hit me. If I'm near the gator bog, then there's a boardwalk not too far from here, maybe a mile or two. That will lead me directly out to the swamp entrance and the head office. I looked around the cabin and found the map that we keep of the entire swamp with all of our trails and stations marked. Okay, I'm in sector 14, and the boardwalk is a mile and a half southwest of me. Right over the Florida border. I'm going to have to try to sneak out of here though. Maybe I can make a paddle for the boat that way I don't have to swim. I looked around the cabin, taking inventory of what I have available. There are some battery packs, a set of radios, a flare gun, and the emergency rifle with 20 rounds of ammo, plus the lantern and a couple of flashlights with glow sticks as backup. I think there's a backup oar in the fan boat, but I'll need to check to be sure. The other thing I'll have to do is distract the lights, and whatever that thing is in there. I may need to use either a flare or a few of the rounds of ammo. I don't think bullets will hurt the lights though. I thought it over for a few minutes. This was going to take some trial and error before I go anywhere, and I've seen what those things out there can do to the cabin so they could break me in half no problem. I'll load up a flare and see what that does. I have six flares total, so one shouldn't be an issue. I loaded it up, 
stood at the window, and took aim at the nearest light. The flare shot off, the red light almost blinding me. Before it landed I saw it pass through the light. The light changed. It had a face now, gaunt, with hollow, black eyes. Sharp teeth showed from the twisted maw, almost as if it was screaming in terror. I heard a roar of anger from it, and it shot toward the cabin, howling. I pulled the shutter, trying to close the window before it got here, desperately hoping that would keep it out. It banged against the side of the cabin, and I could hear claws scraping against the wood. At least I finally had an answer to their state. They were solid, so maybe bullets could hurt them. Okay, I think I'm ready. There's a small propane tank under the camp stove in the corner. I can rig that to a flare, throw it out there, and shoot it as a distraction. Then I jump down from the trapdoor, land in the boat, and roll my way out of here. I'm going to wait for a while and observe. That swamp light I shot at is still howling outside. That's a sound I'm never going to forget, it's, it's like a child screaming, but warped, as if it's being put through an echo and drawn out. God, I hope I make it out of this hellhole. The radio suddenly let out a burst of static. I could hear a voice coming through. Cassin, Cassin are you out there? Holy shit. It was the captain. Cap, can you hear me? I'm here. I'm in the section 14 cabin. I shouted back into it. The howling outside got louder, the clawing at the wall more furious. Cassin we searched the cabin. You weren't there. Where the hell are you? What does she mean? I've been here for two days. They had to have seen my boat down there. Look, we found your boat back near that torn up gator. Just stay where you are, we'll find you. Captain, I'm in the cabin, I haven't left the damn cabin. I shouted back. I was panicking now. If they couldn't find me, what hope did I have? I think leaving is my only hope. I need to get the hell out of here, and at least get back to the main office. From there I can at least been a little more safe behind some cinder block walls, instead of this old rickety cabin. I have to go through with my plan. I'm writing all this into my phone, and setting it up to go out automatically when I have signal again, if I don't make it, hopefully somebody can read this and find my body. I still don't know what the giant creature is out there, but I assume it's what tore up that gator the other night. I'll try an update again if I can make it out of here. God. Please let me make it out of here. It's raining again. To be honest with you, I'm terrified of rain. I never leave the house when it's storming outside. But to give myself some credit, I never used to be like this. I used to love watching the rain fall from outside the windows, but now I always have my curtains pulled tight across the edges of the windowsill. I wish I could show you what made me the way I am, partly to warn you, partly to verify myself. But I can't. I can only write out my story like it's some sort of fantasy. As if it's just another bizarre story on the internet that deserves to be forgotten in a week. If you see it like that then that's fine, but I won't forget. I'll never forget. In 2012, I was a 21-year-old college student, I was absolutely madly in love with nature, and all things wild. I had spent my childhood roaming up and down tree lines fantasizing about mythical creatures and fantastic monsters. Now there I was in 2012 as an adult, studying forestry with dreams of defending those tree lines and fantasies I held so dear. I was absolutely ecstatic when my professor announced an opportunity for some extra credit. He suggested that we spend a few days of our upcoming break, walking along some trails and paths to remind ourselves, why we were doing what we were doing. As an avid hiker I knew of a hiking trail, a few hours over from our town, that offered plenty of room to walk with very little crowding. The only ones who really walked more than a few minutes down the trail, were the park rangers, and the chances of seeing one of them on the ever-winding and expanding trails of the forest seemed small. Hey Lily, want to take a trip down to the preserve with me? I asked as the bell finished tolling signaling the end of the school day. The girl next to me, Lily was a quiet and sweet girl. She had long brunette hair that stretched just past her shoulders and gentle green eyes. 
She was the type of person who people admired from afar. Beautiful but silent. A passing joke or compliment would make her smile, but she'd very rarely comment back. To most that'd make them move on to the next person, to me, that made me want to be closer to her. We'd been friends for a while at this point, whether or not any sort of romantic intent was had between us I couldn't say. We just knew we connected on some sort of level. Yeah of course, just tell me when. She looked into my eyes with a soft smile on her face. I smiled back at her. I hoped this trip would turn out well. A few days passed, Lily and I spent our free time in stores gathering food, supplies and tents together. Soon enough we were all packed up and ready to head out. We took my small car with our bags tied down on the roof, and took the highway a few hours east. By the time we got there it was mid-afternoon, still plenty of time to walk, but also a bad time to find parking. There was plenty of people here walking their dogs, setting up lunches and walking the paths. I thought you said it'd be quiet, Lily asked with a slight snicker. I rolled my eyes in response. I'm sure these kids aren't planning on hiking a few days in. It'll get quiet I promise. I spun around and began taking our large packs off of the roof of the vehicle. For as big as they were, they were surprisingly easy to carry. Lily slipped the straps over her shoulders and waited for me to start heading towards the park. As we approached the trail's entrance, we saw a ranger loosely standing guard. You guys heading in, he asked, there was no hostility or caution in his tone, he was just merely asking a simple question. Yeah, that's all right, right. I questioned the fit middle-aged man. Of course, just let me know your names and take my card. If you need anything call down to the station. There's a couple ranger shacks deeper in, feel free to use them if you need to just make sure to clean up. The ranger gave a welcoming smile and handed me a small business card for the local ranger station. Thank you. Oh, and my name's Max, this is Lily. Lily gave a small nod at the ranger and he nodded back respectfully. Well Max and Lily, you enjoy yourselves out there. We'll be patrolling around so if you see us don't be scared to say hi. With those words the ranger backed away from the entrance, and we began our trek. We spent half of the first day slowly walking in quiet appreciation. There's something so liberating about walking with no time limit. It's like all of the world's stress slides right off your back and the only thing you have to worry about is yourself. In that exact moment you're all that matters. No bills, no studies, no cares. Just avoid snakes and strange plants and you're all set. It wasn't too long into our journey before the sun began to nestle itself behind the trees and the warm, but steadily dropping, temperature of the late afternoon's winds began sweeping under our sweaty clothes. Let's find a clearing to settle into. Lily said, her head tilting from one direction to the other looking for a place to set up. I nodded in approval and saw a small opening further down the path, clearly made by others who took a similar trip. It only took a few minutes to set up our tents in the clearing, and to start a small fire. After all that walking and hard work, we were finally ready to be off our feet for a while. Lily plopped herself down on the opposite side of the fire I was sitting at, and pulled out a granola bar to eat. I felt a rumble in my stomach, and pulled out one of my own. This place is really beautiful. She said, taking a large bite out of the bar. Yeah, haven't seen many animals yet though. I unwrapped my food and placed it on my lips ready to take a bite. I quickly glanced over at Lily and froze. In the increasingly darkening forest just off the trail, just behind Lily, was something about the size of half a football. It was cloaked in the darkness, but I assumed it had to have been some sort of small critter. I began to squint my eyes trying to focus on it. But whatever it was seemed to fade out of existence going straight into the ground. Everything alright? Lily asked. I realized it must have seemed like I was staring at her with food half in my mouth. I laughed and shrugged, shaking my head softly. Yeah sorry. I thought I saw an animal or something off in the woods. It was small, could have just been a rabbit or something. It must have burrowed into the ground though. My friend peered over her shoulder into the silent woods and looked around. 
I knew she wouldn't see anything, whatever it was left as quickly as I caught sight of it. We ended up finishing our meal, extinguishing the fire and climbing into our separate tents. I slept like a log, all of that walking put me out like a light. It wasn't until the morning that I woke up. I stumbled out of the tent nearly tripping on the small fabric ledge at the exit of my portable shelter. The hot and humid summer's morning sun hit my like a pile of bricks. Just so you know, I think we need to watch out for snakes. Lily said softly while I was wiping my brow. I looked over at her to see her undoing the tent's supports from the forest floor. Did you see one? I asked, bending down and following suit with the camp cleanup. I think so, I heard something rubbing on the bottom of my tent last night. I opened my eyes and the indents on my walls looked like a pretty thick snake trying to wiggle its way in. She didn't seem bothered by the potential late night visitor, so I kept her warning in my mind, but continued on. As our journey went on we realized that every step we took there was another blotch in the sky. Somehow a storm was brewing overhead that none of the forecasts we had watched warned us of. How much longer until it rains? Lily was interrupted by a large thunderclap nearby in the clouds. I felt the earth tremor below us before a few raindrops began falling from the dimly lit sky. Thanks Lily. I said arching my head towards her direction. She scoffed, and I laughed. The rain was little more than a small drizzle at that moment, but it was clear it was going to get worse. Let's hurry and find a place to set up. I watched as she began to increase her pace, slowly moving from a walk into a jog heading deeper down the trail. I followed suit right next to her. For a while it seemed like we weren't going to find a clearing anytime soon. We were already on the verge of being considered undoubtedly drenched, and to our luck, at that exact moment of thought, another strong explosion of thunder erupted from above. This time the floodgates were opened, rain began to fall with a purpose, and with enough force to erupt on impact, splashing everything nearby with the drop's watery contents. Hey, right over there! I heard Lily yell out, just barely audible through the thunderous rain. She was running off of the main path down a small side trail nearby. I looked at where she was heading and saw a small cabin. I ran off the path with her. With each step more and more mud thrust itself against my legs. I increased my speed hoping to catch up to my light-footed friend, but something caught me off guard. The tip of my foot slid underneath something and my momentum carried me downwards, face first into a mud bath. For a few seconds I was dazed, just laying down in the runny muck pit. I eventually looked down to my feet and saw what looked like a thin tree root, also caked in dirt, erupting out of the ground. But as my eyes kept on the root, those initial assumptions fell to the wayside. The shimmering of the mud is what made me realize that whatever this object was, it was moving just beneath the mud. Then it clicked in my head, the snakes Lily had brought up, I had just tripped over one of them. I felt a shiver cross over my back, and I jolted back up to my feet and continued on my path, abandoning that snake behind. Without another incident I made it to the cabin doors and busted inside, finally free from the hurricane-like storm. Wow! A familiar voice rang out in the shack. I looked over to see a drenched but otherwise clean Lily staring at me with an amused smile on her face. Decide to have a wrestling match out there. Ha ha funny. I said looking down at myself. Mud was dripping off of just about every pore of my body. I think I met one of your snakes you mentioned out there, it decided to give me a little trip. Oh really? Lily said as she grabbed me and turned me around, searching the pack on my back for something to help me clean up. You were right, they're pretty thick. I wonder what kind they are. I can't imagine them being venomous being that wide. I felt the hands of my companion yanking out fabric from my pack. I took some time to look around the cabin as Lily pulled the towels free. It was wooden, old and completely empty. There was a cooking stove off to one side, but other than that it looked very sparse. Clearly it was only meant for a quick one night stay. Here, get yourself cleaned up. I turned back around and Lily handed me a bundle of towels. 
I immediately wiped off my face and brow. The dirt was already starting to dry and stick to my skin. Thanks. I replied to her as she began setting up her things. I put my pack down against the door and walked over to a window still wiping myself down. I watched as the rain continued its assault on the earth, the dirt running like rivers down the valleys and trails both natural and man-made. It looks terrible outside. I remarked. I heard a small groan of acknowledgement come from behind me. I let my eyes trail over the forested wetland over to the path we took to get up here. My body locked up when I saw something right where I tripped. Something was protruding from the ground like a small pillar. I rubbed the inside of the window fruitlessly to clear off the fog and obstructing rain. I could barely make out what looked like a thick, partially submerged branch broken off on one end with small twigs splintering off skyward. Hey, come and look at this. I called out to Lily who was still fondling around with her bags. Is it the snake? She asked, rising to her feet. I don't think so, it looks weird though. I watched the mud-coated object get hammered by rain as Lily approached and peered outside. Is that a broken tree root? She suggested. I could only shrug. Whatever it was wasn't moving. Wait, Lily chimed in again, look at the color. As more and more of the rain ran its way down the object, the less obstructed by mud the object became. I narrowed my eyes, pushing past the raindrops on the window, and noticed exactly what Lily was talking about. Whatever was under that mud was a pale shade of grey. Oh my god. Lily gasped and grabbed her mouth. What is it? I turned and looked at her, my eyebrow upturned in confusion. Look at the end of it. She said holding her breath. I turned my gaze back outward and focused in. I felt my heart drop. Fingertips. It was an arm reaching out of the ground, still as the grave. Oh my god. My voice wavered slightly. We should call the rangers and get them out here. Where's their card? She asked, hand extended towards me. I reached into my pocket and pulled out a wet but legible business card. Without hesitation Lily snatched it out of my hand and began dialing the number in. Hello, I'd like to report something on one of the trails. She paced back and forth on the squeaky cabin floors. I turned and kept my gaze on the hand. It looked petrified in place, fingers eagerly reaching towards the sky, letting the water rush over it. We're at, she began to stutter, we're at, uh. I heard the voice on the other side of the phone chirp up, and Lily nodded. Hey Max can you take a step outside, and tell me what number's next to the door. I peeled my eyes away from the hand. I felt an increasingly oppressive air pressing its way inside the cabin. I shook my intuition away and walked to the door. I opened it up and stepped outside. I peered towards the arm and could see it more clearly without the blurry window between us. It was hairless, smooth, and the fingernails seemed clean and trimmed. The water that gushed over it almost seemed to vanish on impact, as if it was some sort of sponge. I had to force my eyes away from it to view the number on the wall. 17. I took a deep breath repeating the number in my head, before the sound of a loud clap echoed off behind me. I jumped slightly on edge. I turned back towards the direction of the arm, and saw nothing in its place. Just the mud quickly running down the trail. I swallowed hard and rushed back inside. The number 17, but I think the arm fell back into the mud. It's not there anymore. Lily's eyes went wide as she relayed that information over to the dispatcher. It wasn't too long until she pulled the phone away from her ear and hung up. They told us to stay put, and that this storm's not going to pass anytime soon. They said they've got a ranger on the way, and the police have been informed, but it might take them a while to reach us out here. I bit my lip and looked back outside towards the empty path. I hope it didn't get dragged away by the current. I mumbled, Lily came up right beside me joining me at the window. I'm sure they'll be able to follow that mud slick down to wherever it goes. On the bright side that rain cleaned you up a bit. She gave a reassuring smile and I looked down at myself. My clothes were still riddled with mud, but the rain on my skin seemed to have washed away most of the dirt. 
I guess that's always a plus. I said stoically. Come on Max, let's make ourselves at home at least. I'll just lock the door in case, well, you know. Her voice trailed off. In case there's a killer out there, I mumbled at her as she walked over to the door and flipped the lock. She turned around and averted her eyes from my gaze, choosing instead to continue her mission of getting set up. After a few minutes of silence we had our food laid out in front of us. We had agreed that once the ranger gets here our little expedition was over. We had seen more than enough in just the past two days than we could have in a lifetime. Let's eat and try to get some sleep. I said, chowing down on some extra rations. Lily nodded and joined in on the feast. With full stomachs we set up for bed. I noticed my friend kept looking out towards the darkened windows. I could feel tension in the air. Everything alright? I asked. Lily shook her head dismissively. I just feel weird, like I'm being watched. I'm sure it's nothing but just to be safe. She ripped off her pillowcase, then mine before walking over to the windows, and draping them over the glass as makeshift curtains. I just don't want anything looking in at us while we sleep. I don't blame you. I made my way to my bedroll and caseless pillow before lying down, trying to get comfortable. Lily did the same. It was a few hours into the night before I heard Lily's hushed voice. Max, Max, wake up, do you hear that? I opened my eyes less groggy than I expected and met Lily's gaze. She was staring at the wooden door of the cabin. I spent a few seconds watching the door before I lightly saw the handle of the door jiggle. Someone was trying to get in. What do we do? Lily asked, I was speechless. Maybe it's the, our whispered conversation was interrupted by a loud knocking coming from the other side of the wooden door. Bang. 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 I jumped to my feet. It's got to be the cops. I began my slow meticulous walk to the door. Who's out there? Silence. Hello, I yelled again. Abruptly the banging started again, loud enough to drown out my voice. I took a step back from the door and kneeled close to the ground. Each impact on the door rocked the wooden frames of the small cabin. I watched as one of the pillowcase curtains began to slowly slip off the window. No. Lily whispered, tears in her eyes. I rushed over to the window just as the fabric fell, and was met face to face with the darkness outside. The banging on the door stopped suddenly. I very carefully kneeled down and grabbed the fabric in my hands to toss back over the window. Thud. Appearing out of the darkness was the palm of a hand, it slapped the window with a heavy force. I could only see the pale palm and the shroud of blackness outside. I quickly threw the pillowcase back on the window, and backed up to Lily. She was shivering, her eyes wide with fear. That was the hand Max, that was the hand that was outside earlier. I felt my heart drop into my stomach. I wrapped my arms around Lily for as much my comfort as hers. Thud. 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 The wet palm of the hand kept slapping against the glass, I could hear ripples of cracks spreading along the windowpane. I squeezed onto Lily as she balled up, and kept my eyes focused on the pillowcase, covering the glass hoping it wouldn't fall and expose that lifeless arm again. With one last thud it stopped. A light shone through the fabric of the window mere seconds after the attack halted. I could hear the struggling sounds of wheels rolling up towards the cabin. I let out a sigh and a prayer that the rangers had finally made it. With the sounds of the wheels stopping just a few yards away, I finally heard a voice call out from the void outside. Lily, Max, you in there? The voice sounded familiar, it was the ranger from the day prior. I slid to my feet dragging Lily with me. Yeah, we're inside, but someone's out there. I yelled. I rushed over to the door and opened it to see the ranger standing stiff off in the middle of the small opening in front of the cabin. He was facing us, but the light from his rover coupled with his hat covered his body in intense shadows. His body seemed rigid. Come out of that box and we'll get you home. The ranger said, his voice seemed different this time, disjointed from his body. I stayed quiet, something was very wrong here. Step out of there. Now. The voice grumbled, 
unrecognizable from earlier. Are you all right? I called out a little more than a whisper. Of course I am, can't you see my smile? The ranger tilted his neck backwards. His hat slipped from his skull, which allowed the light from behind him to illuminate his face. His eyes were wide and full of both pain and fear, his lips were quivering in shock. I backed up more into the doorway and watched as two impossibly long fingers trailed their way from behind the ranger's head, and made their way across his cheeks to his mouth. They slid inside with little resistance, and began pulling his lips outward in a mockingly gruesome smile. Then they kept prying. I watched as his lips strained with the force of the fingers inside of his mouth. His lips became white with the stress placed against them before a shower of red erupted from his mouth, parting the centers of his lips like sliced meat. I'm so perfectly happy. A voice called out from just behind the ranger, its voice thick and unnatural. I looked for the source and froze. There, right next to the ranger's feet was a half-submerged human face dug deeply into the mud. Its black cold eyes shone from some unknown source. Whatever this was, was a monster of the strictest definition. It gaze was so vastly separated from humanity, that there was no common ground between us. As I locked eyes with this thing, human in shape and deviled in eyes, I saw the ranger fall into the mud. Just behind his head was a long spider-like arm stretching out of the ground, seemingly changing its size and shape, as if it only faintly followed the laws of this reality. The ranger's body twitched and spasmed on the ground, as more and more lifeless hands began to slither out from the mud, wrapping their hands around his body. I was so thirsty, but now I'm so very hungry. The submerged head called out unblinkingly towards me. Without another warning the ranger's body was ripped under the earth and devoured by the mud. The ground where he was shifted and bubbled over like a small eruption. The creature's eyes stared at me with a deadening gaze. It was observing me. I let out a small chirp from my mouth. Without changing expression the head effortlessly started gliding through the earth towards the cabin, fingers and arms popping out from the earth around it like fins from a shark. I had stored enough courage to slam the door shut, and lock it before running back over to Lily who saw the whole thing. What is that? She asked, her voice trembling. I shook my head and slumped down next to her. I don't know. We sat in silence until the sounds of scratching came from below the floorboards. Hundreds of fingers tearing away flesh to the bone trying to burrow their way upwards. All we could do was sit in the corner furthest away from the windows and pray they didn't get to us. That night we watched as the floors pulsated upwards and downwards, as the foundation began to crumble. Those arms were going to drag us, and our wooden coffin downwards into the earth. I didn't know what to do. I sat there as the floor cracked open and mud crept up through the seams of the boards like blood flowing from a vein. I sat waiting to die but Lily had other plans. She grabbed my hand and yanked me up my feet. She stared at the door for a split second before sprinting off with me in tow. She bursted open the door and ran towards the ranger's vehicle. Luckily for us the ranger never shut it off before the earth took him down. We both hopped on its seat and zipped off the path back from where we came. I hazarded a glance back towards the cabin to see it crumbling into the ground, but there was something else there. Still half submerged on the path mere yards away from us, was that unblinking head, its black eyes shone dead set and emotionless on our escape. We kept driving and driving for God knows how long, until we hit some other rangers who were on a scouting mission up to us, and their missing comrade. We told them everything we could, but the looks of disbelief said enough to us. We were labeled as emotionally distressed and unreliable witnesses. The powers that be listed the disappearance of the ranger, and the cabin as accidental by case of mudslide. Now every time it rains I wonder if somewhere out in the woods, a single head peers out on the trails waiting for someone to pass by, a million hands waiting just below the surface to drag them down into the earth. I was maybe 10 years old. Still awake in my bed, when I looked at the door and saw a small boy, maybe 7 years old, 
with short straight blonde hair, fair skin, wearing a red shirt. He had inhumanly large and slanted dark eyes like those of an anime character, or a grey alien from the movies, and was on all fours, just smiling at me with a mischievous look. It scared me a lot, and I felt it was, evil somehow. I'm 25 years old now, and I'm still afraid of sleeping alone. I don't know what it was. Sometimes I tell people I've seen an alien, or a demon, or a ghost, or an elf. Could someone here explain to me what it was? It certainly looked malevolent, or at least mischievous, and it seemed to be non-physical, since it just materialized in my house and just disappeared afterwards. Just for context, I live in South Brazil, in a rural area. After finishing masturbating, I started to feel sleepy, as I usually do. But as I drifted off, my lower body, from my waist to my feet, began to shake. When I opened my eyes, sitting on my lap was a pile of what I could only describe as tentacles emitting a low red light, and somehow it was projecting almost screaming into my head. It only disappeared after I turned my phone light on it, but the shaking continued. It only stopped when I turned my bedroom light on. Would anyone have any idea what this could be? I've experienced things like this before but never with enough detail to see an actual presence in front of me. I think someone died in one of the apartments next to my work. The last two weeks or so there's been this. Black figure. At first it was kinda hooded, but then I sensed it's a female, an older female. I started to see her clearer, and she want. Leave. Me. Alone. I've told her to go away, leave me alone, I can't help you etc. I'm not that religious, but I prayed the standard prayer our father. It helped for a little while. But not anymore. I can feel her trying to attach herself, and I keep telling no. She's getting bolder, and honestly. It freaks me out. I'm scared she might have followed me home but my fiancé and dog don't sense anything. What do I do? I can't smudge or anything since that stuff is unavailable, and this is my workplace. No live candles or anything is allowed indoors. How can I get her to leave me alone? When I try to ignore her she comes closer. My friend and I are still questioning our mental health after experiencing this. We were going for a walk when we passed by the large primary school, and heard the sound of children crying, laughing and screaming like usual. We laughed it off until I, the first, heard one of the children say something to me, calling my name. I turned around to see the children still casually playing. No child was looking at me. My friend noticed I stopped walking because I was confused by what I heard. Then, a few children began talking at once saying something to us that only an ex-friend would say. About 20 or so children were talking at once, in the same beat, and they were calling me a nasty person who had betrayed them, something my ex-friend would say. It felt as if something was using their mouth to speak. I thought I was hallucinating, but my friend who was standing right next to me was hearing it too, as I looked next to me. She was as astounded as I was. For a few minutes it went on, something was berating us through their mouth. The teacher on yard duty seems to pay no attention to this event despite walking past them. I assume she thought the children were playing a prank, but were they? The other children who were not involved seemed to completely ignore it. Story time. My roommate and I were driving to Estacada for pie and coffee. I saw a reflection of what appeared to be eyes alongside the road between the road and river. Then, as we came closer, driving, I saw what appeared to be a human-like head, shoulders, and forearms behind a tree, above a horizontal tree limb. It startled me because I had never seen anything like that before. We drove for another mile or so, and neither of us said a word. Finally, I said, Kevin, did you see something back there? He said yes. I asked him what he saw and described to me what I just wrote. The next day, we went back to the site to see if maybe we could figure anything out. That limb was about 7 feet above the ground. 
It was dry, and we didn't see any tracks. Across the highway, there was a swamp with a cliff behind it and timber and farms beyond that. There was a game trail diagonally from the highway to the river, which is about 75 feet away. That's all. Description of creature, it must have been around 10 feet tall, judging by the limb we saw it behind. Dark brown in color, short neck, wide body compared to me, 6 feet 4 inches 240 pounds. Late one fall evening in 1978, around 2 a.m., our horses suddenly became very agitated and noisy. Figuring a bear may be prowling about, my son and I grabbed flashlights and our 30 to 30 and hurried off to investigate. By now, the horses were very upset and in danger of hurting themselves in an effort to get away from the bear. I was fearful that the bear may have entered the corral. When we arrived at the corral, Whatever animal was present was crashing off into the brush, we could hear it. The horses were terrorized. To our amazement, a 7-inch diameter tree, which had served as one of the posts of our corral, had been snapped and bent over. It seemed odd that a bear would do this, but we had no reason to suspect otherwise. We shined the light off into the woods but were not about to go tracking off into the dense woods at that time of night. We did not want to enter the corral with the horses worked up the way they were. We decided that they were slowly calming down in our presence and we may as well go back to the tree to take a better look at how it was broken. That is when I came to know a fear that I didn't think possible. At and around the base of the tree were footprints which were obviously not bare. As we looked closer, the slow realization came upon us that these footprints were very large and very human-like. As the unthinkable became obvious, I felt a tingling wave sweep over my body and the feeling that I was not present in my own body, but merely an observer from a distance. I could not accept what I knew was true. The prints were deeply implanted into the soil at the end of slip marks that were about 8 to 10 inches long. At the end of the slip marks were the deepest imprints. Five very human-like toe prints. I believe this was caused by the animal's foot as it dug in to brace itself to break the tree. This is the first I have talked of this incident. Soon after it happened, I sold the property. I was never comfortable there after that night, always feeling. I was being watched. To this day, I still suffer nightmares where I hear panicked horses and awaken to the vivid sight of those footprints lit in the flash of a lightning bolt. I had always been an avid and capable woodsman and hunter. I know game and the ways of wildlife. This is something that I cannot explain. You can use this as you wish. I am now 67 years old, and I think it needs to get out. Only my son, who sits with me as I write this, and I know what really happened that night. We agreed to tell my wife and daughter it was a bear and wiped out the prints. We do wish to remain anonymous as we feel our credibility and prestige in the area would be damaged. We are one of the largest landowners in the county. Long drag marks of something very large were pulled through a small clearing and then through very dense clumps of Oregon grape, huckleberry, and what I would guess was manzanita. These shrubs and small trees had significant damage to them. I would have discounted this as the work of a bear but for the fact that the damage reached a height in excess of 10 feet on the scattered trees along the drag path, and the drag marks continued for almost 200 yards before gradually diminishing, all while going up an incline. About two hours later, my cousin and I were on the southeast side of Baldface Creek and noticed a large, at least 7 to 8 feet tall, animal covered with dark brown fur sitting on a stump, yes, sitting on a stump, watching us directly across from where we were hiking. The animal stood, made a gesture, and strode off into the surrounding forest. Curious, we decided to try to get a closer look. As we descended toward the bottom of the hill to the creek, we heard a large amount of noise and turned to see that not 100 yards more, and we would have run into a bear and her cub feeding off the berry bushes along our previous path. To this day, I am unsure of the creature I saw and question whether or not it was motioning my cousin and me out of potential danger. Other witnesses, there were a total of five people that witnessed the drag marks and damage to vegetation by the old deserted mining camp, and two witnesses that observed the animal, Bigfoot. 
Environment. This incident occurred at a confluence of two mid-sized creeks at the base of Biscuit Hill, which to my knowledge is around 3,275 feet tall. The main vegetation for this particular area is mostly a mixture of pine and fir, with thick areas of manzanita, I believe this is the shrub, huckleberry, and Oregon grape. I was a part of a Navy SEAL team called SACOP Recon. If you know anyone who was a Navy SEAL they'll tell you they never heard of us which is by design. They'll think you mean Spec Ops. We're above that. Spec Ops guys don't even know we exist. The team operates within special access programs, all of which are programs and projects that have the highest security clearance the US government uses. I can't tell you any of the things I worked on and I wouldn't if I could. Let's just say that if the military or an intel group needed to see or do anything underwater that no one could know about and that also required knowledge of technologies and information that even regular SEALs aren't cleared to have access to, they'd send us in. Our job was to survey the site in detail. Not like you see on National Geographic, where they do some sonar scans and sit back and write a paper about it and pat themselves on the back. They take years sometimes decades to do what we have to do in a few days. We map out every inch of the area with high-quality sonar, infrared, visible light, x-ray, backscatter microwave, and a few things I can't mention. By the time we're done, if there's a dime sitting buried in the sand on the ocean floor you can find it in our data. Our work is quickly processed and handed over to our sister team called SAC Op Strike. Normal SEAL teams call these guys fire teams. They do everything from sabotage, disarming mines, to underwater combat. Yes combat. Actual underwater combat. They have special weapons designed to work underwater and I'm not talking about mere knives and spear guns. Anyway, it was 2013 and we were sent to the Baltic Sea with orders to check out something that had recently been found on the ocean floor by some sunken treasure hunters. It's called the Baltic Sea Anomaly. The Swedish government had quietly shut the treasure hunters study of the object down and made them sign national security oaths to keep their mouths shut and play it off like they can't find funding for further expeditions. Meanwhile they called the US for assistance. They have their own divers of course, but this thing was shutting down any and all electronics that came within 200 feet of it. They were stumped. The object itself was located about 300 feet below the surface and was just sitting there on the ocean floor. It was almost perfectly round except for a few sections that looked as if they had been cut out. It had the basic shape of that ship Han Solo flew in the Star Wars movies, the Millennium Falcon. The treasure hunter's original sonar image had been published before the Swedes had the situation under control so the public was already theorizing it to be a UFO. It was not. The object sat at the end of a long trail in the sand that stretched out on the bottom and into a ravine that appeared to be cut out of a small undersea mountain. This gave the impression to some that this was a crash landing scar on the ocean floor where the object had slid to a stop upon its sinking. It was not. I was looking forward to the challenge of performing a reconnaissance mission without the aid of electronics. We brought a few devices with us just in case, but were fully prepared and expecting not to be able to use them. We even had underwater flares in case our lights shut off. Our mission was simple, determine the basic nature of the object and survey its exterior in detail. This sounds easier than it is. Especially without cameras and electronics. To determine the nature of the object we use the null hypothesis approach. This is where you try to rule things out by attempting to disprove your hypothesis. In this case we were acting on the hypothesis that the formation was natural in origin. Was it sandstone or a buildup of sediment that just happened to form a shape that coincidentally looked like a construction? Deep down I was thinking it was probably some World War II equipment that had been scuttled or blasted off of a ship during the war. Maybe the base of a large ship-mounted gun. But why would it be knocking electronics out? And how? At any rate all of us were geologists, marine biologists, and oceanographers so we knew exactly what to look for. I know that might sound odd to you. You have to understand that knowing what we are doing in all situations that we might encounter is what the military was paying for. 
You are not deployed in our group without these skills. If you don't want to do the schooling stay in the regular SEALs. In addition to our skill set our team only had two squads of three men each and no commanding officers. All six of us were officers of equal rank. We designed the missions ourselves and operated with extreme self-discipline. If you need an officer to tell you what to do, then you aren't fit for our kind of work. The Navy learned the hard way a long time ago that a commanding officer's ego can ruin a mission in certain circumstances. And while it might be necessary to have one when the men under him need that to perform, in the case of SEC op missions they only get in the way and risk lives and mission failure, and we did not fail at our missions. It wasn't allowed. Teams in the old days had to keep shanking their commanding officers to ensure mission success and finally the Navy just started letting us do our thing. My squad was going to start by taking samples of the surface material that had settled or otherwise built up on the object. We would drill through it with diamond-tipped hand-powered drills we had to determine what the object beneath was composed of. We'd do this with the aid of special chemistry test kits we had which were designed to work in ocean water. Remember, we couldn't use spectrometers because electronics were useless. The other team was going to examine every inch of the thing looking for signs of manufacturing. Both teams would also create a map of the object's magnetic field and variance if there was any, using only handheld compasses and underwater pencils. Yes, we were that good. We began our dive when the sun was exactly 45 degrees above the horizon. This would provide enough light so we wouldn't need to use our flares for most of the day. We didn't bring air tanks except small ones for emergencies, and instead had hoses coming from the surface, supported by airbags every 50 feet. This would allow us to stay down as long as we needed. The strike team was topside in the boat making sure the air pumps were working and preparing for whatever they might have to do once we came back with our assessment. They weren't expecting to have to do anything as we all assumed that this was either a piece of wartime hardware or an ancient ruin but they were prepared anyway. They always were. On the way down, I noticed there were no fish or life of any kind in the waters around us. Usually that time of year you could find flounder, herring, cod, and other species of fish swimming about. Maybe it was an odd coincidence but I found it noteworthy just the same. As we approached the object a strange feeling came over us. It was an unusual feeling for us all. It was mild fear and apprehension. We had all been in much more dangerous situations than this before and we were trained not to fear. We didn't fear death, injury, or even drowning, yet all of us reported the same sensation. We wore special dive masks that covered our entire faces so we could speak to each other. Sound travels well in the water and so as long as we were close enough we could all discuss what we needed to. We agreed to continue the mission in spite of this feeling but to make sure we kept each other aware of any increase in feelings of duress that we might experience. We soon arrived at the object and split up into our respective squads. Up close the object was clearly not a natural formation, but we would go through our process anyway to be thorough. The object was somewhat flat on top except for a small perfectly smooth dome on the right side. To the left side there was a stairway going up to the flat top. The right angles and straight lines on the object had been dismissed as a rare but real natural phenomena that occurs due to the molecular nature of certain types of stone combined with water erosion from tides and currents. But here the stairs were sandwiched between flat stone walls on both sides which would prevent water from moving in the necessary directions to erode the stairs into the perfect steps that they were. I chipped off a small chunk of the material on the side of the structure and put it into my test kit's receptacle, squeezed some chemicals into the enclosure, and shook it. I already knew but the resulting color of the mixture verified that the object was indeed covered with a thick layer of silt and sand that had built up, compacted, and hardened over time. It must have taken a long time to get into the state it was in because that part of the Baltic Sea didn't have a lot of turbulent water or natural silt. I got the drill out and turned the hand crank as the bit sunk into the caked on silt and sand. It went down about 4 inches when it hit the underlying structure. I withdrew the drill, blew the silt out of the hole with a turkey baster type of device we use, and looked in. I recognized the material right away. It was coarse-grained granite. Pink, black, 
and white specks together. The surface of the object wasn't just made from granite which shouldn't be found at the bottom of the sea, but it was polished granite. Perfectly flat and smooth. I cleared off some more of the compacted sand covering the area and showed it to my team, Brent, and David, both of whom were busy mapping the magnetic variance of the object. David swam over to the other squad to inform them of the discovery while Brent showed me the map they had made thus far. It was unbelievable. They drew on a plastic sheet that had a sketch of the object on it with a special kind of grease pencil that worked underwater. The lines they drew around it represented the distance from the object where the magnetic field the object emitted varied from standard north or south, and each line had a number on it indicating how many degrees off from the expected compass reading it was at that point. According to the map, the object was pulling the compass needle a full 45 degrees away from magnetic north towards itself. This effect was not present at the surface as we had checked before descending. Just then David swam back over and told us that the other squad had found something that we needed to see. We met them behind the object where the bottom of the structure met the ocean floor. The men had discovered a small doorway. My squad volunteered to go inside. We removed our air lines and hooked up our emergency air tanks, each containing about a half hour of air. It was dark inside the passageway and so I lit up a flare. We were in a hallway that led back towards the front of the object, but underneath it. The walls had less silt on them and we could wipe it off with our hands down to the polished granite. About halfway back the passageway ramped upward and we walked up and out of the water into a large room inside the structure. The room was dark and cold. My flare lit the walls and ceiling revealing the same polished granite as the outside. There were engravings in the stone wall every 4 feet or so. The ceiling was about 12 feet from the floor. The room was a half circle in shape and had three granite tables that resembled altars a little bit, one on each side of the ramp and one behind it. The rest of the room was bare. I tried to turn on my flashlight and as expected it did not work. David started sketching the images on the engravings which appeared to me to be depictions of human sacrifice. In the images, the rituals were taking place on the top exterior of the very structure we were inside. It was clear from the scenes depicted that this building wasn't always underwater. Either the oceans had risen since it was in use, or the land had sunken. Brent pulled me over to one of these engravings and pointed. There in the image was some creature devouring the sacrifice. The men in the scene weren't sacrificing people to some deity, they were feeding a monster. It was like a man in that it had two legs and feet, however at the waist it appeared to have about a dozen tentacles coming off its body but no arms. It did have a head though but it looked more like a giant mouth gaping open with a large teeth. The thing had large feathers coming off its back and the top of its head as well. I've never seen anything like it depicted before however there are some Aztec and pre-Columbian figures that are similar in a few ways. Brent and I quickly measured the room's dimensions and did a walkthrough, covering every square foot of the place. We found a stone door that appeared as though it was supposed to rotate on a central shaft, however we could not get it to budge. We discovered a stairwell that descended downward, but not back into the water. This went down into stone. We surmised that the structure had been built on top of an even larger rock or mountain that was now buried by the seafloor. We descended the stone stairwell, which was not made of the same granite as the upper chamber. Instead this material looked like standard seafloor basalt. The stairs ended about 40 feet down into a small antechamber. There were some relics on the floor there, a spear and a set of ankle shackles. Both appeared completely oxidized to the point where they would probably disintegrate upon our attempting to pick them up. The room had an opening that led into a huge cavern which was lit by an abundance of bioluminescent algae which coated much of the cave walls as well as a small river that flowed in and out of a set of pools. The water glowed a bright aqua color from this algae which made the water cloudy and opaque. There were large quartz crystals embedded in the rock along with iron pyrite and veins of gold. The view was spectacular. We wondered aloud what had been in those shackles. We suspected it was the creature from the engravings or perhaps a sacrificial victim. There were footpaths that ran between the rock and stalagmites that formed the floor of the cavern. 
We split up and each proceeded down different paths giving ourselves exactly 10 minutes time to meet back at the foot of the stairwell. Our air would be running out by then and we weren't going to risk trying to breathe the ancient air down there. We'd have to head back soon. We took air, water, and sand samples as well as photographs using old-fashioned, non-electronic cameras loaded with a special film designed for low light. The cavern seemed to go back at least 300 feet, with a ceiling around 30 feet high. The width I estimated in the neighborhood of 50 to 60 feet. I could hear water pouring into water coming from the rear of the cave and so I headed back to ascertain whether or not there was some kind of waterfall back there someplace. I rounded a bend in the footpath and saw the source of the sound. A two-foot diameter flow of water was pouring out of the sidewall of the cave about 20 feet up, arcing into a pool that was recessed in the floor. Behind the waterfall there were several skeletons chained up to the back wall. I started to take some photos of this when I felt something wrap around my right ankle. Looking down I beheld a black tentacle protruding up out of the pool which had wrapped around my lower leg several turns. I instinctively pulled my leg away but it tightened its grip as I did so. I sounded a distress call from a noise-making device we each carried on our wetsuit as I struck the tentacle with my fist in the hope it might release me. It pulled back a bit which caused me to fall onto my back. I reached for my rock pick as the thing rose up out of the water. It was hideous. It used its tentacles for support on the black rocky ground. Its head was like an octopus only the mouth was front-facing. It growled, bearing what reminded me of shark teeth with several rows going towards the back of its throat. It started to pull me towards it and lift me up off the ground when Brent reached me with David not far behind. He struck the tentacle that held me with his rock pick letting loose a glowing aqua-colored fluid from the creature's flesh. It immediately dropped me and turned its attention to Brent. It's saucer-sized, Amber eyes twitched back and forth as it examined him a moment before it lashed out with two of its tentacles. As it did, both of these appendages projected long, thin, sharp, white ribbed rods from their tips which pierced Brent's torso. The creature then lifted him up and pulled him in towards its gaping and shrieking mouth. David had arrived at my location by then and began to drag my body backwards away from the thing as it put Brent's head into its mouth and closed it in a circular fashion around his neck where its teeth cut through Brent's wet suit and flesh. He flayed around trying to break free for a moment before the creature had bitten his head clean off. We could only watch and take a few photos from a distance as it used its tentacles to peel back his wet suit and munch on Brent's body like a human would when shelling a shrimp. I got to my feet as David announced that we needed to let the strike team handle it. The two of us headed for the stairwell as fast as we could. Before we could get there, the creature swam along the river next to us and jumped out of the water, tackling David while thrusting its pointy rods through him just like it did to Brent. David and the beast fell over sideways and it proceeded to feed on him. It did so with such ferocity and speed that I had no time to try to save him. All I could do was run and take advantage of the fact that it would be stalled from killing me for a minute as it feasted on David. I glanced back as I ran and saw that the creature had put David's lifeless body down and had begun to pursue me. I guess it didn't want to lose any of that rare human meal it had discovered. I suppose it had been feeding on the algae in the water for so long that the taste of blood once again after all these years was too much for it to resist. Just as I was reaching the opening into the small chamber where the stairwell was, the thing flung itself at me and I landed on my back. I had my rock pick in hand by then so I started to bang its pointed tip into the meat of one of the monster's tentacles. It withdrew it but as it did, the thing wrapped its body around my upper torso and pressed its flesh against the back of my neck where I could feel tiny bristle-like hairs stick into my spine. Like little needles they inserted deep into my nervous system where the creature hijacked my motor control. It used this method to couple with my brain and our minds became one mind. I knew its entire history, thoughts, and experiences. I understood its deepest motivations and desires and it knew mine. It used my legs to walk as it rode me like a horse back up the stairwell, into the chamber above, and down the ramp to the open sea outside. It hadn't been out of the cavern in over a millennia as it needed a human host to climb the stairs. 
I could feel its excitement as we exited the structure and proceeded to kill the three men in the other squad who had been waiting for our return. Knowing the lethality of the strike team had opted to steal an inflatable motorized raft and sink the boat by having me chip a hole in the hull with my rock pick. The sound of my doing this alerted the seals inside to our presence and two of them entered the water to check it out as we sped off in the raft. I got an oversized trench coat to hide the creature on my back so I could move about among the masses without causing a stir. I haven't checked in with the Navy in several weeks now and am currently sitting in a cheap hotel room in Barcelona typing this. While I would like to be rid of this thing, I also have to admit that I feel its pleasure at the taste of human blood and meat. Our minds have become one and I am as much it as I am me. I know the military will have sent a wet team to track me down by now and I know they will probably eventually find me. I have to stay on the move. The trail of dead will soon give away my whereabouts as the method of the kills is unique and leaves its own signature. I'm putting this story online as a last ditch effort to get a message through to my dear mother, Jane, the only person I still feel connected to and whom I miss dearly. I love you mom. I'm sorry about all of this and maybe someday if I'm lucky we can meet again. I've already left too many bodies here, so I'm leaving Barcelona tonight before daybreak. But first I feed again. I like to spend some alone time occasionally. Last fall, in October 2023, I spent a day in the Allegheny National Forest in northwest Pennsylvania. I like the forest because of the tall trees and nature, I'm able to relax and think to myself without interference. I got there early in the morning just as dawn was breaking. I got out of my truck and hiked to the Rimrock Overlook. There was a foggy blanket draping the Allegheny Reservoir. I had my binoculars and my camera and wanted to go deeper into the woods. The daylight was just peeking through the forest and the wildlife was beginning to wake and become active. As I was watching the birds with my binoculars, out of nowhere this weird sound came. It was like a mix of a deep growl and a long moaning that just echoed through the forest. It was so surprising and different from the usual forest noises that it actually gave me a creepy feeling. My heart was racing while I stood there not moving, still holding the binoculars to my eyes looking around anxiously trying to figure out where that sound was coming from. Then I saw it. It looked like someone or something moving past the dense underbrush. It was huge and somewhat hidden in the fog. As soon as I noticed it though it vanished. I was freaked out. I thought that maybe it was a bear or an elk. But that unfamiliar noise had me thinking that it was something out of the ordinary. After a few minutes of whatever it was vanishing, the forest went back to normal. I was left standing there equal parts scared and curious. Then it showed itself again, but further to my right, I guess it was about 50 yards away from me. Whatever it was it appeared as tall as a young tree, around 8 feet tall with shoulders over 4 feet wide. It moved in a way that was smooth but also very strange. I didn't want to blink and miss it. The creature quickly moved around bushes and jumped over logs surprisingly quiet for its size. The fur looked rough and its colors shifted between light brown and red when the sunlight hit it. I could see it had a wide back, big muscular arms, and a flat face. The odor that I was then smelling is what really scared me. It was faint, like a rotten smell that seemed to stick in my nose. It made me nervous and my heart started pounding. I wanted to run back to my truck but I was just too curious. Then suddenly the thing turned its head towards me and I just froze. I briefly saw its huge forehead and distinct brow. But then it was gone. It simply vanished into the thick forest just as quietly as it had first appeared. I saw something weird that I can't explain. Was it a Sasquatch? I finally decided to walk back to my truck. My mind was going crazy. Every little sound sent an alert and I didn't feel safe anymore. That night at home I experienced a series of bizarre dreams. It was as if the creature was communicating with me. I know that sounds crazy, but that is what happened. In fact, it took several weeks until the dream stopped. I had this overwhelming feeling that I was supposed to return to find answers. I have resisted returning to the area because of my fear of encountering the creature or, maybe, something more terrifying.
I have so many encounters with the weird and strange I don't even know where to start, but I think you will like this story. This crazy scary dog stopped me from drinking one night. This happened in Port Orchard, Washington around 2009. I was in a program called Drug Court which required me to take random UAs, stay sober, and pretty much get my life back together because I had got caught up with a marijuana charge in 2008. So instead of doing the two years in prison they wanted to give me I had the opportunity to do a program of recovery called Drug Court. I jumped at the opportunity. I was sober for about 9 or 10 months and was in a relationship with the lady that I am still friends with today. I tend to have a sixth sense about things and I had a bad feeling she was cheating on me. And I was looking for an excuse to go drink. I made my mind up and started to leave the house which was up a steep hill towards a dark road next to a park and I would have to continue on past the park and down another steep hill. Once I got to the top of my hill to walk towards the park I was stopped suddenly in my tracks because about 50 or 60 yards away from me was a dark black muscular vicious looking pit bull or rottweiler. I'm not completely sure and I did not want to find out. It was just sitting in the middle of the road blocking my path to the bar. So I said nope and turned around and walked back down my hill through my backyard over a fence through my neighbor's yard to get to a gravel road that led to about the middle of the other hill I had to walk down to get to the bar. Now this was quite a long way away from where I originally planned to walk because I don't feel like going out of my way and walking through neighbor's yards. So I'm walking down the gravel road and all of a sudden I see the same dog just walk up to the end of the gravel road which was probably 30 or 40 yards away from me and just sit in the middle of the gravel road growling at me. I was scared to death that this dog was going to attack me. But it just sat there and I could hear it growling from that far away. I'm 100% positive it was the same dog. But how did this dog even know where I was headed? How did that dog even know to stop me the first time? I was completely blown away and confused. I just wanted to get drunk and forget about my girlfriend for the time being. So to keep a long story short I turned around walked back through my neighbor's yards over the fence and back to my house and called my sponsor. I did not drink that night. And I stayed sober for another year and a half after that. Not sure if that was my guardian angel or what. I've told the story before in AA meetings and I'll end with this. Whenever I want to screw my life up it seems like God sends evil demon dogs after me. No joke. I've never seen the dog since and I really hope I don't again. I'm a retired federal law enforcement officer. I also did 18 years in the US Army as an MP before cancer forced me out. I still work for the DOD. I would like to share two short stories. I was one of those unlucky ones who while serving in Kansas had the misfortune of seeing one of these creatures decide to enter the perimeter of our military base. It made sounds that I can't even describe, guttural growling and bone rattling roars and screams as it went over a 15 foot fence. We had more than one occurrence of this type of behavior at this base. We're always ordered to ignore it and never document anything about it, except for a verbal report to the chain of command, but nothing more. When I was stationed there we had a private fresh from basic that was on duty and witnessed a display at the perimeter fence. The private freaked out and abandoned his post. The next morning he was sent for medical evaluation. I think the kid had a mental breakdown over what he witnessed. He never returned to our unit. If Uncle Sam didn't want anyone saying anything, that was the normal routine. I was 24 when this happened in 1994. What I saw was an 8 to 9 foot tall black with some gray around its face and on its chest. It would make these terrible noises and look straight into the CCTV cameras, then charge the fence. If nothing happened after two or three times it would charge and go right over the fence without any effort at all. If a mobile unit appeared when it was screaming and roaring it would throw rocks or smaller trees at the fence or sometimes go over the fence towards the vehicle. The only time I ever saw it leave without making a big show was once a helicopter buzzed the area with a spotlight and a thing hightailed it back into the trees and didn't return. A big bright light from the sky makes them feel the way they make us feel. The second story was in 2018 in Kansas, south of I-70 about 30 miles from Lake Milford. 
I was working late and had about a 40 minute drive home on rural county roads, some paved and some gravel. The area has rolling limestone cliffs and lots of dense trees, pastures, and hay fields. It was about 10.30 p.m. On a winter evening, cold but no snow on the ground. I came around a curve on this two-lane county road that had only a few feet on each side before the trees started. No ditches to mention. I saw what I thought was a tree extremely close to the left side of the road. I had time enough for the thought to enter my mind that's a big tall stump no branches. Then the eyes became visible and I thought I was going to have heart failure. The intensity of fear and sheer terror that gripped me I never felt before, even in combat. As I looked at those eyes I drifted over towards it unintentionally and as I passed, if it had reached out it could have touched my side mirror. I immediately swerved back to my lane and looked into both my side mirror and rearview mirror but couldn't see it. I have nightmares of that drive home regularly now. I understand now what witnesses describe after an encounter like that. I'm a veteran with six deployments between Iraq and Afghanistan and I was in some major engagements over there and I can tell you nothing in my life has ever affected me like that drive home. To this day I will not drive that road after dark and I've had that creepy feeling of being watched at my farm numerous times since that night. I have two cattle dogs and I won't go outside without them close to me. I always carry a gun on me and have a rifle or shotgun in my truck. Honestly, L don't think it would matter if this being decided to have it a human. It's game over. I remember experiencing a medical procedure as a child that I did not have in this reality. I recall, vividly, the dark red tinged room around me and laying on a metal table. While on the slab, I was being prodded and touched all over by seemingly giant praying mantis beings. I remember being horrified that they had bent arms, large black eyes, and insect bodies. I remember replicating their posture which was peering over with their arms by the side of the body and hooked wrists, T-Rex arms. I remember waking up while it was still dark, that same night, and my clothes were inside out. I even remember that I awoke feeling desperately thirsty and found my blue water bottle was no longer on the bed as it had been thrown under the bed frame. I remember feeling like I was being watched and the room felt weird. I felt confused because I had gone to sleep holding the bottle and had been lying under the blanket. Even to my young self, it was a shock to be tangled in blankets half flung off the bed. I've always been a deep sleeper and I usually wake up in the exact position that I've fallen asleep in. People have commented on how still I am while I sleep my entire life, and I've explained it's probably because I'm deaf which means sound doesn't wake me and I don't remain in a lighter stage of sleep. This also means it is hard for me to wake up as I'm so deep asleep so it's notable when I suddenly jerk awake. After waking on the other side of the bed with a completely disheveled bedspread, I was petrified of needles and blood tests. I suddenly developed a phobia and had to be held down to be given injections or needles. I recall my mum stating, you used to be fine with needles and watch them do it. Why are you acting like this? Stop thrashing and trying to run away. What happened to you? I told my mother about them and called them disgusting cockroaches. This was before I grew into adulthood and saw a photo for the first time depicting mantis beings, she said it must have been a dream. The needle phobia became a huge proponent to my medical fears which grew bigger and bigger. I became scared of the dentist, refused medical examinations or tests, and resisted medical visits. I started having dreams about medical teams coming into our home wearing white lab coats, and feeling terrified when I saw them taking my family members to run tests. The dreams were nightmares that continued for a few years after this incident. I remember the beings as detached and determined to meet their experiments or tests. These seemed human, but they were cold and detached. After some time, I recalled a memory of being in a medical setting with a huge light above my head and multiple faces holding instruments near my head and face. I asked my mum about it for years, even in my teens and early twenties, and she maintained that it never happened. As I've grown older, I've always remembered an even earlier encounter. I'm still wearing a nappy and I'm on a table slab with the prey mantis beings around me. 
I don't remember waking up afterward or being fully conscious of what happened before or after hence starting with the early encounter remembered with more detail. However, it wasn't an isolated memory with the mantis beings. I did a meditation a few years ago to try and calm myself down before an experience with a needle. I was unwell for a while and needed weekly cannulations. I hadn't received a needle since I was 8 years old because the phobia became so severe. I refused blood tests and would have obscene reactions in the dentist when they would insert needles until they started giving me gas to calm down. So, during the meditation, I saw the mortifying ordeal of being on a slab with mantis beings around me and tools being pushed into my body. I could see instruments going into my belly button, the top of my head, and down my throat. I was nearly going to stop the meditation but then, in an instant, the procedure was over. The next part of the memory resurfaced. Suddenly, the mantis beings didn't seem so terrifying. I was taken into a standing tank or cubicle that scanned me. It looked like a liquid but it didn't feel solid, squishy, or wet. They showed me where my DNA needed to be fixed as there was something wrong with my genes. The chamber was a full body scanning instrument that could completely penetrate and view your entire DNA code and body. I was able to see an implant in my brain. It has been some time, but I remember something about an implantation in my brain which was to help reprogram and update my DNA. After this meditation, my needle phobia went away as I dealt with medical teams. Something to note was that I did that meditation which revealed faulty genetics before receiving a diagnosis for faulty genetics. I thought that was interesting. I've had countless UFO sky sightings and strange encounters but this was the most real experience that was rich and vivid in detail, as if it was the same as recalling a birthday party as a child. I've been in contact with terrestrial aliens since I was a child. It was weird lights and apparitions when I was younger. Around the age of 18, it started turning into physical abductions at night and randomly seeing crafts periodically. This carried on all throughout my life until the age of 32. At that time it turned into something completely different. A week before I turned 32 my body started transforming. I have holographic orbs and serpents swirling around me now. It's an energy that I do not completely understand. It's part of me and incomparable to anything I've ever seen. It changes color and can move through solid objects, it reacts intelligently. This energy is inside and outside of me at the same time and it never leaves me or stops existing. The energy regenerates my body and mind. It heals me and can heal others. At one point during the transformation, there was an etheric injection in my arm and I felt a spark jump into my body. It shocked me. Now my eyes glow differently and I feel like I have more energy and soul than I did before. There's also a lot of energy to work with my chakras while lying in bed at night. This transformation has been going on for almost 10 months now. It will be a year around the end of December 2016. The race of aliens that I'm in contact with is the reptilians. The reptilians sent me holographs to communicate, they showed me our history through holographs. We evolved from earth reptiles and then there was some kind of war that's still being fought. From what I've gathered, I'm a reptilian or human hybrid. There's a hybridization program right here on earth with RH negative blood types and other hybrids do exist. Unfortunately, most have been killed, or haven't evolved enough mentally, physically, and spiritually, or want nothing to do with the reptilians out of fear or being brainwashed by organized religion. As of right now, there are only a handful of awakened or empowered hybrids. So there it is. I'm in direct contact with reptilians. They exist and we've formed a bond, they're really good to me. They guide, protect, and upgrade me. I wouldn't be alive without them. They've even saved my life multiple times. I trust them more than I do most humans. When the reptilians manifest on Earth, sometimes the females will come down to play. They look like the Celtic or Nordic race. I can always tell when it's one of them because the women are always perfect, with a glow to them and stars in their eyes. It will only be for some time, a few days or months, and then after that, they just disappear, never to be seen again. 
So basically from what I've gathered we have a race of reptilian or Nordic terrestrial genetic and technological alien masterminds right here with us on Earth. I stand by this firmly. I've spent almost 33 years of my life spinning in their web. I've never been the type of girl who gets scared easily and what's more, I never believed in paranormal stuff and creatures, like vampires, werewolves, etc., until I witnessed it with my own eyes. So, in 2012, me and my family went on a trip to Romania. We basically explored the country because my parents were really interested in its culture. After we visited Bistritza we decided to stop and have a picnic outside the town, even then my gut feeling gave me a warning that something was gonna happen. We stopped near a town called Slatnita. It all happened right next to a forest, there were special benches and a table in the middle of them, and a really small place where you could park your car. So we were just eating and chatting with each other when two people appeared literally out of the blue, I guess that they came from the forest. They stood right behind our parents' backs and they were just staring at us for like a minute. A guy and a girl. The guy looked like he was in his late 20s and the girl looked about 17 to 19 years old. They wore totally black clothes. The girl wore a black long dress, by the way I've just realized that it looked kind of like the dress that Morticia from the Adams family had, a corset, and very long black hair, literally so long, down to her thighs. He wore something like black pants and a black cloak with weird embroidery. He was tall and had long black hair just like the girl. But I mean you may think now, maybe they were just some goth teens who took a walk in the forest, but there are extremely weird things about them. They both were very pale and I don't think they had any makeup, because when they came up to us I could see veins on their necks and hands. The girl had very long and sharp nails without any nail polish. Their teeth, they never showed them, so I could only slightly see sharp teeth on their upper jaw when they spoke. I didn't like them since the moment I took a first glance at them. I can't explain it, there was just something so scary and intimidating about the way they looked at us. When they started approaching us I felt frightened. When I talked to my sister about it she told me that she felt the same. When they came up to us they asked if we were tourists. My parents said yes and they the girl just said, oh, be careful here. Then they turned around and went in the direction where they came from. I was watching them this whole time, but my mom suddenly distracted me, and when I wanted to see them walking away they just disappeared. Literally like they never even were here. Now I'm 26 and I still have no freaking idea who they were and where did they come from, but when I recall those memories and see them in my head it's still so frightening. I have been travel nursing in remote northern communities in British Columbia since 2020. In the summer of 2021, I took an assignment in Fort Nelson, British Columbia. I decided to borrow the staff vehicle from the hospital I was working at and use my one day off to travel up to the Liar River. It takes about 5 hours to get there from Fort Nelson. I took in the scenery on the drive up the sheer remote and rugged nature of the land was palpable. I was on my way back home and close to the 529 km mark on the Alaska Highway when all of a sudden a feeling came over me for reasons unknown. I began to slow the car down. I was going quite slow when I saw something on all fours on the right hand side of the road. It was about 100 feet away at this point it was moving towards the road, coming out of the bush very quickly on the tips of its fingers and toes. Then it stopped at the edge of the highway. At this time I had come to a full diagonal stop in the oncoming lane. The creature was now about 20 feet away. It got up on two legs and appeared to be somewhere around 9 maybe 10 feet tall. It was covered in matted gray or brown hair that looked like dreadlocks. It had a solid muscular build and it walked in a very strange manner that is hard to describe if you haven't seen it. It crossed the paved part of the highway in four strides. It did not look directly at me but was very aware of my presence and I felt it inside my mind when it walked in front of the car. I was completely frozen. I could have moved if I wanted to and here's the wildest part. All parts of this creature were partially transparent. These parts would fade from visible to transparent over its entire body as it crossed the road. 
The transparent parts of the creature appeared blurry or almost made of water if that makes sense. It was the strangest thing I've ever seen in my life. I watched it dash under the trees on the other side of the road and after a while, I collected myself and drove the remaining 75 kilometers back to Fort Nelson. My roommate was selling our old fridge. He didn't let me know that someone was coming to get it one day. And I pull up to see someone loading up the fridge in our carport with no one home. I'm naturally defensive, cause what would you do if some strange guy was randomly in your carport loading up a fridge? Anyways I open with excuse me. What do you think you're doing? Long and short of it is that the dude hadn't paid for it yet nor confirmed with my roommate or owner that he was coming. We still sold him the fridge at the end of the day. I'm a 22 year old female for context. While I was living at uni by myself I messaged a man who had a PS2 for sale on Facebook. It was a really good price and looked really good condition. I really should have known it was too good to be true. Anyway, I message him about it and he says he will drop it off straight after work and that he is working on a building site near where I live. All good right? Except he kept saying he will do me a solid and drop it right to my door, even though I repeatedly said I would meet him at a nearby car park. He said okay fine. He wasn't happy about it but whatever, I was getting my PS2 and I was buzzing about it. So a few hours go by and I walk up the hill to chill with my friend Adam who's a bloke and the same age as me. I flippantly mention that I'm meeting this man for the PS2 and Adam is all like? You can't just meet a random in a car park. I'm also very petite do I guess if someone wanted to grab me they could, which was Adam's thinking. I agree to let Adam come with me and actually it was a good idea. The man texts me again asking if we are still good to meet and what will I be wearing. I thought to recognize me. So I tell him what I'll be wearing and what I look like, and then I mention I'll be with a stocky, dark-haired man with a beard. He stops replying, and deletes his Facebook account. I never hear from him again. I can't help but think something dodgy was going to happen and my friend making me tell the guy I wouldn't be alone prevented it from happening. Apologizing now since I am a horrible writer but, there is a small town called Gilgo Beach in Long Island, New York. It's pretty secluded and runs along a the back of a highway. For those of you who don't know, a few years back there were many dismembered bodies found along the highway in burlap bags. It seemed that the murderer was targeting prostitutes and finding them via Craigslist and other websites. They never found the killer but it is believed to have been linked to a series of similar murders in Atlantic City. Anyway, one night in the middle of winter at about 2 am my friend and I decide to go to the Fire Island Lighthouse which is about 5 minutes from Gilgo Beach and along the same highway. There are deer usually hanging around there at night and we wanted to feel them lol. Anyway, to get to this lighthouse you have to drive over a long narrow bridge and once you get over that bridge there is a roundabout around a big needle like water tower and the rest is beach. I will attach link of picture, there are no houses or stores. It's dark and there is no one there at night. So we get off the bridge and onto the roundabout when I pull up behind an older looking dark colored car on the farthest side of this roundabout. Mind you there are never any cars here this late in this season. A woman in a long coat gets out of this car walks in front of it towards the middle of the roundabout which is just the bottom of the water tower. The car speeds off fast and leaves the women. She is sitting there now all along in this secluded area in the middle of the winter late at night. My cousin and I circled a few times and she just stood there at the bottom of the water tower. She was there at least 30 minutes since we circled waited, then circled a few more times. This woman would have had to walk at least 30 to 35 minutes to get to the first residence. And at least an hour to get to a store or a public place. We ended up calling the cops and never found out what happened. We still think if we didn't show up this woman could have been seriously hurt but since we pulled up maybe the guy got spooked and let her out. But why wouldn't she scream for help? But to the person in the dark car and the creepy women who stood at the bottom of the tower, let's not meet. Unless you are a victim.
Not super bad but long story short, I sold a car to a lady and her kids came with her. They were in their 20s. A few months later, I get a text from the daughter saying the woman passed away and they never took it to get tags and needed a copy of the title and would pay for me to get it since by law I had to be the one to get it. I met them and they gave me money, I got the title and sign it over again technically. Then a few weeks later the son texts me thanking me and shit and then suddenly asks if my wife and I want to have a threesome. I nicely tell him to f off and he calls me leaving me 5 voicemail of him crying and apologizing saying he's drunk and misses his mom. I had a Blackberry in 2014. I actually liked it quite a lot, but the apps were no longer being supported and every time I went outside, the sun would move my cursor around because of the heat. So, my cell phone situation was suboptimal. And I was a grad student who needed to check email and do things on the go, like text people coherent sentences without my cursor flying everywhere. I found a deal for a $300 iPhone 5, top notch at the time, on Craigslist, and contacted the seller. We agreed to meet at a local grocery store, and he said his mom had appendicitis so he couldn't stay very long. I was very grateful that he was taking the time to meet me while his mom was in the hospital. So I baked cookies for the family and met up with what ended up being a 16-year-old kid at a grocery store in Illinois. He gave the phone, which was dead because he said his mom ran over his charger with a vacuum cleaner. I paid him and gave him the cookies, took the phone home, and it worked but wasn't unlocked as advertised so it was unusable for me. Turns out it was stolen. I cried in my car for an hour. It still upsets me to this day because I try to have a lot of faith in humanity. I made his mom cookies. She probably wasn't even sick. First day on a new job a couple of years ago. During orientation, my phone starts ringing. Not a number I recognize, so I ignore it. It's already on vibrate. Then it rings again. And again. By the time I'm out of orientation, I have dozens of voicemails, but more meet and greets with coworkers, etc. When I finally get to check my voicemail after lunch, the voicemail is full. Scores of men leaving messages for Miss Becky, some leaving multiple messages getting increasingly desperate. I've had the phone number for years, so something must be up. I try to Google my phone number. But the calls are coming in so fast I'm constantly interrupted and I'm trying not to look like a bad employee on my first day. When I finally get a search completed, it pulls up a Craigslist ad with a man posing for pictures that no straight man should ever see with my phone number. The call slowed down by the end of the day and within a few days stopped completely and I never heard from Miss Becky again. Mine is a good story, last year I wanted a PS4 so did research and found one with GTA 5, Knack and Battlefield Hardline for $300 on Craigslist and next thing is he knocks on the door of my house 2 hours later and I have the check for $300, behind my micro so no shady crap, he comes in and explains that he wiped it it has controller HDMI and everything, stayed to help set it up and said he liked my house and he hopes to have a house similar to my parents, I'm 16 then, parents help transactions, and explained that he is getting a new job next week and needed the money for his family so I gave him an extra $50 for his situation, good deal. The night was dark and stormy, the kind of night that sends shivers down your spine even before anything unsettling happens. I had just finished chatting with my friend, Jake, over the phone. He sounded distraught, and his words echoed in my mind as I made my way home through the deserted streets. He had been searching for a good deal on a MacBook online, scouring various websites to find the perfect match for his budget. Eventually, he stumbled upon a seemingly too good to be true offer, a brand new MacBook at a fraction of the retail price. The catch? The transaction had to happen in person, in an abandoned warehouse on the outskirts of town. Against my advice, Jake decided to go for it. Greed clouded his judgment, and he found himself in a dimly lit, desolate place, surrounded by shadows that seemed to whisper tales of regret. 
The air was thick with tension as he handed over the cash to the mysterious seller. But things took a horrifying turn. Suddenly, out of the darkness, emerged a group of masked figures. They moved like ghosts, swift and silent. Before Jake could comprehend the danger, he felt a searing pain in his right hand. A gunshot echoed through the warehouse, and he crumpled to the ground, clutching his mutilated hand. The assailants vanished into the night, leaving Jake bleeding and broken. He managed to crawl out of the warehouse and call for help. By the time I reached the hospital, his once intact hand was reduced to a gruesome sight, only three fingers remained, a cruel reminder of the price he paid for his online bargain. As I sat by Jake's bedside, the weight of the story settled in the room like a thick fog. The incident haunted him, not just physically but mentally. The trauma of that night played out in his restless eyes, and the shadows seemed to dance menacingly on the hospital walls. In the following days, strange occurrences unfolded around Jake. He would wake up to the sound of distant whispers, his dreams plagued by masked figures reaching out for him. Paranoid and sleep-deprived, he became convinced that the ghosts of that forsaken warehouse were haunting him, seeking retribution for disturbing their malevolent domain. I tried to dismiss his fears as mere post-traumatic stress, but as the days passed, even I couldn't ignore the eerie atmosphere that clung to him. Objects would inexplicably move in his presence, and the air grew icy cold whenever he spoke of that fateful night. It was as if the spirits of the warehouse had latched onto him, determined to make him pay for the intrusion. One night, as I sat with Jake in his dimly lit apartment, the room plunged into darkness. The air became heavy, and a cold wind whispered through the cracks in the window. Suddenly, the flickering light of a single candle illuminated the room, casting eerie shadows on the walls. And there, in the corner, the masked figures materialized. They were ethereal, their forms shifting between reality and nightmare. Their eyes, empty voids, locked onto Jake, who trembled in terror. The room echoed with their ghostly whispers, recounting the details of that ill-fated transaction. I tried to grab Jake and escape, but an invisible force held me back. The figures approached him slowly, their spectral hands outstretched. And then, with a bone-chilling wail, they vanished, leaving behind a chilling silence. The room returned to its normal state, but Jake was changed. His eyes, once filled with life, now reflected the horror of the supernatural encounter. He spoke of a curse, a consequence for seeking a forbidden bargain in that forsaken warehouse. From that day forward, Jake lived in perpetual fear, haunted by the shadows of that macabre night. The warehouse became a place of dread, a portal to a realm where the price of greed was paid in blood and torment. And as for me, I couldn't shake the feeling that those masked figures lingered in the shadows, watching, waiting for the next unsuspecting soul to venture into their unholy domain. Thanks for watching. Be sure to subscribe for daily stories. We at Horror Den of Misfits really enjoy this, and your support would be appreciated.